Ladies and gentlemen, we're live. Myth Vision Podcast. You do not want to miss this show. I cannot tell you how important this show will be. Um, Dr. Kip Davies will be joining us here to discuss the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Bible. And some of the things that Christian apologists, maybe not only Christian apologists, I would say both Jewish and Christian apologists, anyone who's of the Bible, are probably not going to tell you. And if they do, let's just downplay these things and make them not relevant to the discussion at hand. So for those of you who are tuning in, uh, people are going to start trickling into this show as we start. I'm going to get you guys with the intro, and you do not want to miss this PowerPoint presentation. If you want to super chat your questions, feel free to. I'll do my best to interrupt Dr. Kip throughout the presentation as long as it works within the theme of the discussion, and we'll ask your questions. If you super chat a question that's not relevant, I'll screenshot it for the end of the show when we're done doing the presentation to ask him your questions. Now, let's go ahead and do our intro and do a 30 second one at that. Ladies and gentlemen, I made a custom intro for Dr. Kip Davies, and I hope you enjoy it. It's a little bit entertaining, but it shows some important texts we're going to be discussing today. And I cannot tell you how valuable this show will be. Christian apologists are either ignorant of this topic and ignorant of the details we're going to be discussing today, or purposefully ignoring them and downplaying their power. Ladies and gentlemen, go subscribe to Dr. Kip's channel. It's the it's the pinned message here in the comment section. Welcome, everybody. 135 people right now that are popped up. I gave you guys a long intro to give you time to come in. You do not want to miss the presentation and the discussion today. My good friend, Stephen Nelson, he's brought up these charts years ago, and I asked other apologists and other scholars that are like Dr. Michael Brown, he's a Christian apologist, even um, Rabbi Tobia Singer and others to address the topic. And some of the things we're going to discuss today, I have to say that 
no one handles them the way critical scholars do. And today you're going to hear that from Dr. Kip Davis. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kip. You're muted. Hold on. I muted you. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> go for it. Go for it. Sorry. Thank you, Derek. It's so good to be back. What do you think about that smokes, intro? Man? That intro. That's crazy stuff. And I, I was actually, I was looking, I was looking around when, when all the applause started. I've never heard, I've never heard that before. <laughs> so that, that was awesome. And I, I wanted to say too that last picture the last dead sea scrolls fragment that that showed up on your intro is crazily enough a fragment that we're going to talk about today wow so i did that unknowing i did not know that it's know, a miracle it's a miracle everybody it it's is. A miracle. hit that like button the, hallelujah but seriously welcome family i love you guys thank you so much for the support the positivity the thumbs up going and subscribing to dr kip's channel dr kip what are we going to be talking about today so we're going to be talking about um, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they've been misused and abused by apologists and also how they provide information about uh, early Judaism, about the transmission of the text of the Hebrew Bible that also gets ignored by apologists and, and especially Bible translators. And I have... I mean, there's, there's, uh, I, I intend at some point to do like a whole series of videos about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, are you familiar with uh, Ten Minute Bible Hour? I am. Yeah, he does a really, really nice. Uh, I actually like his channel quite a bit, but um, he does a really nice. I think it's like a 25 minute uh, snapshot of uh, the scrolls, and I'm using that as a. I'm going to use that as a jumping off point to. Uh, to talk about lots of things that uh, that tend to get missed. When scholars talk about the scrolls, they like to talk about, uh, or, or I should say, sorry, let me back up a little bit. When apologists and scholar, 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 apologist, apolo, scholar, just, <laughs> I don't know. The, the scholar, the ones, yeah. The scholar apologists, the ones with the degrees, when they talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, they like to talk about how old they are. They like to talk about how many copies of the texts of the Hebrew Bible there are in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and especially how many of those texts match exactly or very nearly exactly to the preserved uh, Hebrew Bible text that we have today. Um, what gets missed very frequently in these discussions is that while all that is true, there are even more texts of the Dead Sea Scrolls which show dramatic differences from the Hebrew Bible text. There's, there's scrolls that uh, defy classification in large part because scholars are so hesitant about what they are going to label as Bible uh, mm. or as something else. It's an on, it's, it remains an ongoing debate. Um, that's not something we're going to get into today. I've I've pulled out um, a few fragments from from four different manuscripts, and we're going to talk about uh, two topics in particular. The first is how the Dead Sea Scrolls show us uh, the or or illustrate to us and and help substantiate uh, scholarly theories about the development. Uh, within Jewish, Jewish religion from polytheism to monotheism mm. and how there was a vestigial polytheism that lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years, even after the Babylonian exile within Judaism. So that's the first thing we're going to do. The second thing we're going to do is look at a particular fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls and how it has been misused and abused by apologists as a um, as a marker of fulfilled prophecy in the New Testament. So, okay, and, and right. one thing I'd like to comment before you actually go ahead, you could share if you'd like to, um, I'll add it to the screen when you're ready. But one thing I want to make a comment, my good friend Stephen brought up, it was a really good point too. I sent you the image before we started. Um, to put it simply, all of our Bibles that we have in English right now are mistaken about some of the stuff we're going to be discussing, uh, that the Dead Sea Scrolls 
are illuminating and they don't find themselves in our Bibles because their translations are going with the Masoretic. They're ignoring these very important parts that are, I guess you could say, anti-Orthodox position or they go against the grain of what maybe Orthodox Judaism or Orthodox Christianity would like to accept. But they're found within these fragments of an earlier form of Judaism where this wasn't something to be shy of. It's like later developments of God from, like you said, polytheism into monotheism start to cause people to change the text or at least go with versions of it that come later. And we're going to see that problem spelled out very clearly in PowerPoint presentation, or maybe it's not PowerPoint, but it's a presentation for sure. I use Keynote. Okay. So Well, cool. while you get that up, everyone hit the like. Go subscribe to his channel real quick because oh, you're about to see some. We ready to go here? I'm ready when you are. I, I think it's All important right. that we get started. No more playing around. I get a lot of uh, people say, get to the point, you know, and we can always talk about other things once we get done with this presentation. Okay, we're going to dive right into this then. Let's okay? do it. We're going to start in Job, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. And um, I'm going to be using, uh, as I've, I've noted before, this is my favorite version of the Old Testament. This is the Brick Bible, uh, as told and illustrated by Brandon Powell Smith. And uh, he has titled this uh this chapter in his book god makes a wager with satan so starting in job chapter 1 verse 6 one day the sons of god came to present themselves before yahweh and satan was among them he's the shifty looking guy of course yahweh asked satan where have you come from and satan replied roaming about the earth going here and there Yahweh said to Satan, Have you taken note of my servant Job? There is none like him on earth, perfectly righteous, fearing God, and shunning evil. I want to pause here just for a second and, and okay. note that this, this expression at the end here, shunning evil, is actually uh, it's something that's repeated throughout the introduction to the, to the story of Job. And some scholars believe that this is a significant marker about what this story is really about. Um, I won't. I won't have time to get into a lot of this, but I just want. I just want people to be aware of that. Maybe I can do that in a in another uh, in another live stream or something. So, Joe is good at fearing God, and he's good at shunning evil. Are you getting feedback from me, by the way? No, you're fine. Are you getting echo? Okay. Like I can hear myself in your. Yeah, I can hear myself in my ears. Okay. So let me try and let me try and see if this helps any. Okay. okay. Try it now. Now? Yeah, okay. I think that's probably better. Yeah, I okay. think so. Excellent. Okay. All right, let's continue. Satan answered Yahweh, and not for nothing, you have put a protective wall around his family and his possessions, blessing his property. And increasing his wealth. But if you were to stretch out your hand and destroy everything he has, he would surely curse you to your face. I'm going to pause here again and just make a translation note. Uh, do you happen to have this this uh, this story up on your screen there, Derek? Yes. So what yes. is what does your verse eleven say? Okay, first off, I'm reading from the heretical NIV because I used to be a King James onlyist many moons ago. And so verse 11 in the Satan Bible NIV, I meant, but now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. I think every English translation, as far as I know, reads this as curse you to your face. And this is interesting. Because the Hebrew word here is actually Yavarechecha, which literally means he will bless you. Hmm. Now, the explanation uh, from time immemorial is that this is euphemistic. 
that at the time of writing Job, it was uh, unacceptable to utter the the Hebrew word of curse in line with uh, with God or with Yahweh. So they had to they had to euphemistically cover this with a different word. And I'm not sure I buy that. Um, another way to translate this verse is uh is to say did i oh, did i write this yeah is is to say if you were to stretch out your hand and destroy everything he has raise this as a question would he certainly continue to bless you to your face Ooh. okay, okay. now it's a really really subtle difference but i think it's an important one and i think it aligns more clearly with the presentation of the Satan, the, the Satan figure in the Hebrew religion. Um, we're accustomed to him being especially adversarial, with him being the embodiment of, of all evil, with him being entirely opposed, diametrically opposed to the program of God and to the program of Christ. And I think this colors the translation, whereas maybe in the original telling of this text this is a proposition by the satan as a way to resolve a question that yahweh has himself about job do you see what i'm getting at yeah yeah so it's a subtle difference i just wanted to bring that up um and i think it's an interesting one but we're going to continue yahweh said to satan Fine, then. I put everything he has in your power. Only do no harm to the man himself. And so Satan left Yahweh's presence. And this is the story. So um, why do I tell this story right at the outset? At, I, I think, um, and especially the, the way that, uh, that the Brick Bible has illustrated it, um, this, this story, uh, is a really nice illustration of the council of the gods, the, mm. the pantheon, the, the divine council that was, was believed to govern the cosmos. This was a common belief throughout the ancient Near East and one that seems to have been shared at various points in the history of the Israelites. And the the pre-Jewish descendants, or the I, I guess the pre-Jewish ancestors. Um, so well, I said here, who were the sons of God? Um, it's fairly typical in modern translations and interpretations of this passage to have uh, to understand these figures as angels. Um, it's it's uh it's somewhat problematic because there are perfectly good words in hebrew for angels malach meaning messenger is applied to to messengers from god who do, who visit people on earth there are uh seraphs burning ones and cherubs uh these crazy uh these these crazy snake-headed uh lion-bodied creatures that guard the throne room throne room of yahweh there are perfectly good words to describe angels. Uh, in keeping with the ancient Near Eastern roots of the Hebrew Bible and within the, the, the Semitic culture from which it emerged, the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, were smaller, lower-level deities within this divine council. And we see all sorts of references to the B'nai Elohim, the sons of the God, all throughout the Hebrew Bible, and especially here in the story of Job. So um, we, it's the same sort of expression that you see throughout uh, the, the Ugaritic and the Canaanite literature, such as in the Baal cycle. And uh, this story illustrates the, uh, the the function and and the ancient view of the court of the chief god. Oh. Now, mind, mind you, like everybody who's watching this, 
This is not or original to the Hebrew Bible. This is something the Canaanites have already practiced, not only the Canaanites, the ancient Near East. Uh, we see this, this kind of idea of a pantheon of deities take place in more than just the Canaanite religion. But I just want people to know, like, where would this come from? Well, it's not, you know, the Bible is the first thing. That's another thing. Precisely. The reason you say that they like the Dead Sea Scrolls is because they're older. And they go, oh, the older, the more, exactly. you know. And it's like, eh. The more accurate? Yeah. Well, so, the older exactly. we get, we start running into these problems. But go ahead. <clears throat> so, bullet points. Within the larger Near Eastern world, it was polytheistic. Uh, the the gods, as a group, um, they, they exercise control over the function and destinies of the cosmos. The, the divine council was a reflection of human government. Um, we call it a pantheon. And there's a great, uh, there's a great visual illustration of the pantheon. This is, I believe it was constructed by Hadrian, this magnificent temple in the city of Rome. Uh, he built uh, literally to house the images and the statues of the gods from various cities and regions that Rome collected over the years. So the gods were anthropomorphic and they were anthropopassive. They reflected uh, human characteristics and human feelings. And we see some of this in the Hebrew Bible as well. They were procreative. They were fallible. They were emotional. Think about the uh, opening of the story of the flood in Genesis chapter 6. The gods, the sons of the gods, literally the Bnei Elohim, they come down. They see the daughters of men. They see human offspring, human women, they uh, saw that they were beautiful and they had sex with them. The gods were like super humans. Um, I asked that they, of Dr. John J. Collins recently, just for, just for everybody who's watching. It's on, pay, it's on my Patreon. If you're not a Patreon member, go check it out. I've got tons of videos. I always plug it because it helps me do what I do and it supports me to make this possible. But I asked John, I said, Dr. Collins, I said, Tell me about God. That was my question. And he started laughing like, whoa, that's a lot to ask. And then I was like, no, no, no. I'm saying, you know, God sitting on a throne. He's just like an enhanced king. He's like a, a stronger, bigger version of a human king. But he still has limits. And this is a concept we anachronistically can't picture in the Christian world, uh, that God is all immutable, all powerful, all knowing, all this, all that. And it's like, have you read your Bible and actually read it, not trying to force what you think it is into it? Anyway, please. I, I just I had to say that. I am so happy that I didn't say anything uh, out of step with Professor Collins. <laughs> Very happy about that. So uh, the gods decreed destinies and made ad hoc decisions about the process of governing the world. So a question arises here within this, within this, this pantheon, there's there's a king of the gods and all these lesser deities, which are identified as the Bnei Elohim, the sons of the gods. So at some point in Israel's history, Yahweh became the king of the gods, the, the king of the gods. So how does a god become the king of the universe? There, it happens in a type of an ascendancy. Um, gods were territorial very much like people, very much like human governments. Um, they would work to extend their own territory from their power base. The most powerful God would assume priority and control over the divine council. And this is something that we actually see uh, recorded. Oh, there we go. In uh, the Baal cycle tablet three, columns three, line 33 to column four, line four. But... There's possibly also an ascendancy that we see in the Hebrew Bible recorded in Psalm 89, verses 6 to 19. Do I need to pull this so, up? So I would like you to pull this up. And if you could read it, because I've got the uh, I've got the, the slide up here. Okay. Um, just read each, read each individual verse one okay. at a time, okay? This is so the starting same at Bible. verse 6. I'm using the, the NIV. Bible. Yeah, the NIV for the King James only. They're going to hate it. But anyway, uh, verse 6. 
And it's just, you want me to pause after every verse for you to comment? Yeah. Okay. I have some things to say after each one. Perfect. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? I forgot to say one thing. So I'm going to get you to read this again. Okay. Um, wherever you see the Lord in okay. your translation, I want you Yahweh. to replace that with Yahweh. Okay. Perfect. You want me to blast? You don't want me to. You don't want me to use Hashem. Okay. I, you want me to blaspheme? Okay. No, no, no. We're blasphemers here. <laughs> okay. Perfect. I uh, I have no problem doing that, my friend. All right. For who in the skies, who in the skies above, can compare with Yahweh, with the Yahweh? Who is like the Yahweh among the heavenly beings? Awesome. And not the Yahweh, just Yahweh. Just Yahweh. So skip so, the definite article. Yahweh. Okay. Skip the article. So a couple things of note here. Um, the Council of the Holy Ones, Bekahal Kedoshim. This is, oh, is it? Yeah, there it is. It's on my screen. Cool. <laughs> so Kadosh uh, is a frequently occurring word in the Hebrew Bible that most often means divine being of some sort. Or in this case, most likely lesser lesser gods. Okay, let's continue in verse awesome. 7. Verse 7, in the council of the holy ones, Yahweh is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. There's actually, I don't like this translation at all because the, the, the word, I think it's at the end there. What did it say? Um, uh, he is more awesome than all who surround him. Yeah, then all who surround him. I think this is uh, there's there's a uh, there's a word here, um, bishokhek, uh, which literally means in the clouds. So it it's there's there's a, a reflection here of. I'm actually I do have an English Bible here. Let me just pull this up quickly. Okay. Um, so there's 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 a reflection here of geography. From the perspective of the human writer and the human speakers of this psalm, this is all taking place up in the sky, in the clouds. There is a there is a definite location, uh, a preferred location here. Uh, all right. Um, Do you want me to get a less satanic uh, version? No, we're all good. Okay. Okay. Um, whoops! I think my camera just popped. You're good. I see you. Um, I see you. Okay. Um, so, are we in verse 7? We are in verse... Uh, well, you're okay. working in verse 7. In surround verse him. Seven. So, verse 8 is the next one. Yeah, okay. Okay, so this... This... Uh, this um, uh, oh, I, I, yeah, I, I, look, I jumped ahead here. Um, so... Where it says something like uh, um, Yahweh is held in reference, in, in reverence by those around him, mm -hmm. the 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 expression here is actually Ya'arok uh, uh, Adonai. So, and it's it's a word. This Ya'arok is literally it, it's it's commonly used in a more militaristic context of facing off. So already there's a vision of the divine council in which there's competition. Yeah, the uh, the gods are um, their rivals. As much as they have to work together, they're also trying to best each other. Hmm. So, and again, uh, right at uh, um, yeah, again, this is this is it, it mentions the the uh, Bevene Elaim. These are the sons of the gods. All right. Okay. Let's. Continue in verse eight. Eight's going to be tricky in English for me. Uh, just wanting to make sure that you know you you correct me here because in in the English I'm trying to change the word for God or Lord to say Yahweh, um, not God, and, just Lord. Okay, just Lord. Okay, got it. Who is like you, right. Yahweh, God Almighty? You got Russian it. Yeah. You, you, Yahweh, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Excellent. So do I have anything here? Uh, 
Can all my little gods um, in the chat hit the like button? Thank you. There you go. So there's mention here of, uh, I'm just trying to see what the English equivalent of this would be. Sometimes it's difficult because of the way that they translate this. Um, uh, I think, who is mighty like you? I think it's it, the, the faithfulness. Am is it surround you again in the clouds or it something? It might be. I mean... Um, what do I have next? So, no, that's verse 9. So, um, there's mention here of a secret council of, a, of the Holy Ones in verse 8. And again, these are these are di uh, divine beings. These are like angels. Or, sorry, not angels. These are the sons of the gods. Um, let's just continue in verse 9. Okay. Verse 9, you rule over the surging sea. When it waves, when its waves mount up, you still them. Good. Um, and that sounds like the storm god, uh, like a yeah. storm. So, like a, yeah. And as we see, just continue with verse 10 here. Okay. You crushed Rahab like one of the slain. With your strong arm, you scattered your enemies. Good. So um, we've got the pride and presumptuousness of the sea. We've got Rahav, who is like a mythical sea creature. Mm -hmm. um, and also mentioned in Isaiah chapter 51, verse 9, and Job 9, verse 13. Uh, many think that those passages and what's, what's depicted here is a reflection of an alternative sort of creation myth where Yahweh had to go and defeat this, uh, this great beast. Here, as part of his... Uh, his ascendancy as part of of his his uh, of what's necessary in order to become the king, the king of the gods. So that's oh that's yeah. Just so you know, okay. Um, I, uh, so, someone thinks we're Satanist, or I don't know if they think we're Satanist or not, but <laughs> they don't like it. No, please like it. Oh. No, we're definitely not oh. sat Satanists. Okay. Um, but so. you know what they say, no matter what you tell somebody, if you're not on God's side, whose side are you on? You know, um, it's anyway. true. So people say. Okay. So um, verse 11 and 12. Okay. You want me to do them all in one? Yep. The heavens are yours and yours also the earth. Ooh. Nice loud truck. Someone got a diesel. Did you hear right. that? No, that's yeah. that's my annoying neighbor with his Harley Davidson. Ah, I thought it was a the, diesel. Okay. The legalized noise pollution machines. <laughs> you so. crushed Rahab like one of the slain. Okay. The heavens are yours yeah, and that. yours also yeah. the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. You created the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon sing for joy at your name. Good. So these figures, Tabor and Hermon, these are actually rival Canaanite deities. Hmm. So, and in in the uh, in the the copying and the transmission of of this uh, this psalm, these become more reflective of geographical locations. Okay, let's uh, let's finish this out all the way through okay. to verse nineteen. All right, so I'm going to read. From the uh, verse 13 to 19? Uh, 18 in the English. So, yes. All the way through to the end of 18 in the English. Okay, okay. Your arm is endowed with power. Your hand is strong. Your right hand exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Yahweh. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. For you are their glory and strength, and by your favor you exalt our horn. Indeed, our shield belongs to the to Yahweh, our king, to the Holy One of Israel. Good. And that's in so in this Yeah. And this last phrase the Holy One of Israel is our king. The Holy One of Israel here is is 
the title that the uh, the psalmist is ascribing to Yahweh, and by identifying him as the king, he's also setting him on a plane above the uh, the other rival deities. So within what we have here is a view of a divine council, a view of a, a group of gods who work together and oftentimes compete against one another uh, to control and determine the destinies of the cosmos and of, of people and nations. Uh, within this system, what we also see, and this is something that I'm happy you alluded to within your conversation with, uh, with Professor Collins, the gods have limits. Within this system, one god will always be viewed above the others. And within this system, because there's always the potential that another lower deity can usurp the king, there is no possibility for omnipotence, omnipresence, or omniscience, or what we identify as the transcendent attributes. Transcendent attributes never existed within a polytheistic world in which the gods contended for power. And the reason we, or the reason later generations came to ascribe to Yahweh, the most powerful, the greatest, the all-knowing, the all-present, is because the way that you spoke about the king of the gods relative to all the other gods was like this. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Yeah. Oh, 100%. You, and you so see this. As soon if, as, I was going to say, the way that people treat the Bible and they separate it from the ancient Near Eastern context, I interviewed Dr. Bowen. Those videos should be completely uploaded and onto Patreon tomorrow for everyone who's a Patreon member. But uh, he showed intertextuality or inter intertextuality between the Bible and the, and the uh, Mesopotamian world. But then he, he shows between one version of the Mesopotamian literature and older versions of it. There's, there's this strange development where one of the gods ends up kicking the butt of the other God and taking over and becoming the Supreme deity. So kind of a henotheistic yeah. worldview. You can call it exactly. polytheism in a sense, because it is even even though monotheism, I guess, strictly is there's one God, but yeah. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And what happens as soon as, as soon as you remove all the other deities, these expressions of superiority over the lower deities, suddenly they become expressions of, um, I guess, an, an ultimate, an, an expression of the ultimate, which we tend to uh, now understand as transcendent attributes. Mm -hmm. So, so that's just by way of introduction to um, polytheism and to the divine council within the Hebrew Bible. We're going to move on now. Okay. Um, polytheism, monotheism is definitely something that develops within the Hebrew Bible. You can set all sorts of passages from the Old Testament onto a spectrum, onto a timeline that shows a gradual progression away from a polytheistic world to worldview into a progressively more monotheistic worldview. So you've got texts such as Deuteronomy 32 or Genesis chapter 6 or Job chapter 1 or Genesis chapter 1, which are quite obviously polytheistic. They uh, reflect a cosmos replete with numerous gods within a divine council. And as time passes, you have um, in, the, uh, in, in the reforms of Josiah, when likely large sections of Deuteronomy were composed, or at the time of the prophets, such as Jeremiah or a second Isaiah, uh, there's, there's a this polytheistic view is beginning very clearly to diminish and a Yahweh only movement is strongly uh, emerging. And then by the time of uh, the writing of the book of Ezra or of Nehemiah, you have a full blown monotheistic worldview. You can track this throughout the Hebrew Bible text and you can in many ways um, use this almost like a, uh, almost like an index fossil to uh to date texts mm. 
So that's that's what we're looking at. Um, I'm going to talk today more with with a with a stronger focus on uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, which is one of the really really the most interesting uh, full passages, which reflects this polytheistic worldview. And what's especially cool about it is that we have several manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls which actually attest to this polytheistic worldview. The first one that you see pictured on your screen here is 4Q Deuteronomy J, otherwise numbered as 4Q37. Uh, and what this means is that this is the uh, 37th numbered manuscript from the fourth cave of Qumran. The within the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls are not just caves of Qumran. They're all they're they're caves all up and down the Judean desert, but the vast majority of them are close to a, a settlement known as Qumran. They're within about uh, a kilometer, a kilometer and a half, and there's 11 of them. And they're numbered one through 11. Cave four is possibly the most important because it contains far and away the highest number of manuscripts numbered anywhere between about 520 and 560 individual manuscripts all within this one cave so this mm. is one of them and it's the numbering too so it's a lot so and and the way that the the texts are cataloged and numbered is according to their their canonical order so 4q1 uh, even without knowing the manuscript well, I know right away that's a copy of Genesis because it's the it's it's the first book of the Hebrew Bible, and so they they number them that way as they go up. The biblical manuscripts in uh, K four, I believe, go the way all the way up to. Um, I'm not I'm not going to get this perfectly right, but I think it's close to 150 individual biblical manuscripts and this is just within cave four mm. one cave out of 11 in the dead sea scrolls so 4k 37 is a copy of the book of deuteronomy and it dates to this says here 50 bce it's wrong i think that's probably my typographical error um it actually dates to about 50 ce so this is a manuscript that was copied some 20 years after uh after jesus lived and died and he actually did live and die. Okay, um, nothing controversial there at all. Okay, so uh, here is and yeah, here is uh, is how I would uh, go about reconstructing a fragment like this. Um, I create my own fonts using the actual script of the manuscript, and I just type out what's in the blank in an effort to get a sense. Of, uh, of how big this manuscript was, of what it contained, what it possibly didn't contain. Um, of course, the reconstruction you see on your screen is not quite right because for whatever reason, I neglected to complete it. So that top line would actually stand, extend a little bit farther, uh, probably all the way to the end of the screen. So hmm. here is uh, the translation uh, this is uh, this is Deuteronomy uh, chapter 32. I believe this is verse 8, or is it verse 9? Um, Real quick, while you're looking that up, I want everyone to understand yep. what, we're, <laughs> what we're about to look at is extremely controversial. This is the problem that we find within our Bibles today and Christian apologists don't, either they know this knowingly and they downplay it because it's like, ah, significant. Look at the vast majority of manuscripts we have and what they say this right here is like hold on what did we just find what did that just yeah. say wait till you see what this says this is one of the biggest things Stephen nelson brought this to my you know he was like look you got to check this out ask some of these scholars what they think and um they kind of get around it they never like face it so this will be a powerful presentation pay attention this is big stuff it's true Okay, so you see the English translation there of, uh, of the reconstruction of this passage from this fragment. And while you don't see, I know you only see, there's actually three, only three preserved words, but we can be quite confident about what's in the missing, in, in what we call the lacunae, because what's in the lacunae is something that is, is generally 
agreed to buy almost every surviving copy. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to start here at verse 7. This is verse 8, but I'm going to start at verse 7, which says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he will show you your elders, and they will tell you. And this is what they will tell you. When El Yon, this is the king of the gods, apportioned the nations, when he divided the sons of Adam, he fixed the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of the gods. Derek, the sons of the gods, who did I say these were? Gods, like actual. These are gods. These are actual gods. These are not like people. These, these are humans. minor deities. These, yes, these are minor deities. And what's interesting here is we have a picture of Elion, the king of the gods, dividing up the nations, um, dividing all the people on the earth, and setting boundaries to their territory, and then assigning them to the same number of the minor deities that are within his council. Verse 9 continues, Thus, Yahweh's portion is his people Jacob, the region of his hereditary property. This last phrase here, the his hereditary property, this is the typical uh, language of inheritance within the Hebrew Bible. So here you have a depiction of what happened prior to the time that Yahweh became the king of the divine council. Elion's still in charge. Elion's the one who's dividing up all the people, and he gave to Yahweh uh, the people of Jacob. The is it is this the whole Israel. hereditary property thing? That sounds like daddy and son. And he's giving his son, Yahweh, which is the very name of the God that Christians and Jews alike say, this is God of gods and there's no one above and no one below. And like, you know, because they have a monotheism in mind. This right here is not teaching that idea. This is daddy's given son his inheritance, but it's not just Yahweh that his son. He's got 70 or 69 oh. other, 70 other sons. The God of uh, Moab is known as Chemosh. You know, it, it, I would I would expect, even though no one else is mentioned in this passage, this is the sort of uh, this is the sort of view that the readers and the listeners of this text had. Um, each individual nation, the surrounding tribes who who uh, were were known to Israel, had their own national deities, and this is what this poem is describing: that Elion, the king of the gods, divided all these tribes up and gave each one of them to his sons. Dr. Now, Dr. Dr. Kip, real quick, digital Hammurabi. Thank you for the super chat. Um, uh, this is Dr. Josh. And he says, man, that Dr. Kip, not sure if you can trust that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, only look, use, he slammed his tree so down. There is a, there is a reason I use only a 2k camera. Because I am not brave like Dr. Josh. Oh, I see how it is. Yeah. Appreciate you, Dr. You Josh. It. You got it. Hey, so so before we leave that, I just want to say for those – Dr. – and I'm bringing it up because we see a couple good comments. Dr. Michael Heiser, he's a well-known Christian apologist. I've interviewed him before. He mm -hmm. will equate Elyon with Yahweh. Now, do you believe the reason he wants to make them one and the same and not separate them – is due to the preconceived ideas he's come into the text with? Do you think there's limits to, to his position as to why he can't allow El Yon to be the father of Yahweh? I, I that would be my that would be my my suspicion at the outset. And I, I honestly haven't read Heiser. Um, I I haven't read a lot of him on this. Uh, there's there's other things. The uh, he he takes a similar he he takes a similar position when it comes to uh, some of the stuff uh, taking place in Exodus six, where uh, where Yahweh reveals himself as um, 
as the, the, the patron deity of Israel. Um, and I don't like what he does with the, with the grammar and the syntax in that passage. I'd have to look and see uh, his whole argument, but at the outset, my initial gut reaction right away is that there's a, there is a, a, an existing prejudice here that uh, makes it difficult for some scholars to, to move past or to accept what I would consider uh, an abundantly plain reading of the text. Sorry for so, interrupting, but I hope that no, answers everyone's questions. I mean, I, for I hope it does. Right. So, um, but as you can see, I hope this is a, this is a really problematic text. Um, here is the uh, the offending words here: "Bnei Elohim" on the fragment translates to the sons of the gods in the English. Um, so what I'm going to go through here is now kind of an historical text critical development of what happened in this text. Um, you know, even before we get to what's the, the Greek that's on my screen, Derek, uh, what does your English translation make of on this? Which verse exactly verses, again? Verses eight to nine. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. For, the, for Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. Okay. So there's a, there's a critical change here where the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, have become the sons of of Israel, the B'nai Yisrael. So how does this take place? Well, one of the ways that this, uh, one of the developments within this text we see in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, um, which was made uh, sometime in the third century BC. Uh, the Greek passage the, or the Greek translation of this, the, it translates the uh, the Hebrew word B'nai Elohim as angelon theon. This is the angels of God. When the Most High divided the nations, he divided the sons of Adam. He fixed the boundaries of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. And by the way, for a long time, even before we ever discovered this fragment, scholars had already guessed at its existence they hmm. thought you know looking at this septuagint this greek translation of this passage it sure seems like the original reading was bene elohim and the reason for this is because by the time of the third century um israel has moved is is already moving well away from uh, a polytheistic worldview they're developing uh, a much more Hellenistic uh, view of the cosmos, and something else that's that's really developing in this period is a sophisticated angelology, um, a sophisticated view of the universe where where God's uh, pantheon is suddenly replaced by a, a an enormous collection of of um, uh, angels who fight angels who deliver messages, angels who, who uh, guard the throne. This is, this is something that becomes much more strongly developed in this period. So in this place where Hebrew readers of the text see this phrase, B'nai Elohim, they start to instinctively understand this to be not, not gods in their own right, but angels. Thus, the Greek translator just uh, included the word, the Greek word for this, angelos, the angels of God. So, and here we have uh, the Masoretic text. This is the traditional uh, Hebrew text, which all of our English, uh, English Bibles are translated from. And this is the English translation that you just read here. He divided... The sons of Adam, he fixed the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of Israel. 
whatever that means. So <laughs> yeah, what does that mean? Uh, I I don't spend much time thinking about it because it's 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 a desperate attempt to overwrite something that uh, that was very very uncomfortable for uh, for for the people who were transmitting these Hebrew texts at this time. But I also want to remind people about how old this manuscript is. As much as this made Jews uncomfortable, there was still a tolerance within various sects of Judaism. That didn't sound right. Various sects of Judaism. It's not easy to say. Um, there's still a tolerance for this kind of language all the way up even past the time of Jesus. That tells you, yeah, there's some stuff going on. And I was thinking about this earlier. Got a couple super chats I want to get before we, we press on. I was thinking oh. about this earlier with Jesus and him being tempted by Satan here. Uh, this really strange nations of the earth, like power of the earth and whatnot. And then this picture of Jesus is, if I could use the term, apotheosis, ascending to the right hand of the divine. Um, it seems like a strange change has take place on the understanding of God, but either way, it's like he's doing the he's fighting uh, the evil one, if you will, in this. And there's a lot changing by the time this is happening, I guess. But that, but anyway, a couple super chats, real quick. I want to ask you, and then maybe yeah. you can comment on my statement there. Sure thing. Ben Ben always comes through with some wicked uh, wicked questions. Ben yes, and he's, he he's a patron. He's a patron as well. Ben says. Any other passages where El Yon may be separate from Yahweh? Thoughts on El Yon in Genesis 14 with Melchizedek? Uh, I'd have to, I don't know it offhand. I'd have to look it up okay. here. Genesis 14? Okay. Yeah, Genesis uh, with 14. Yep. Uh, this is, oh yeah, this, means... is, this is Melchizedek. It's, is, uh, he's a priest of, of uh, El Yon. He's a priest of, of El Elyon, literally. Um, mm. So this is, I mean, I, I think what we see here is something. Um, I'm just looking. El Elyon. And so no. at one point, like, like I'm just looking here, and this is my English translation. Um, so it looks like. It says that that Melchizedek, the king of Salem, uh, was the priest of El El Yon, that is the, the translated as God Most High, and he blessed Abraham and said, "Blessed be Abraham of El El Yon, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be El El Yon, who has delivered your enemies into your hand." And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, "Give me the person to take the goods for yourself." But Abram said to the king of Sodom. I have raised my hand to Yahweh, El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from the thread of a, to a sandal strap, and I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abram rich, except only that the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me. And er, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think what's going on here, what it looks to me, uh, based on what I'm, what I'm, I'm kind of guessing at the Hebrew text, based on the English, it looks to me like the king of Salem is a priest of the king of the gods, El Elyon. Um, he blesses Abram. Abram's response to him suggests that no, um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I, uh, I, I concur with your blessing, but in my divine economy. Yahweh is the uh, the leader of the divine council. It sounds yeah. like there's a there's a tension taking place within that text that illustrates some of this uh, the the polytheistic background, the ancient Near Eastern background of the way people operate, and in particular in how in how uh, uh, people from different tribes and 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 different uh, different traditions would interact awesome. with one another. And so I'd I love hope to hear that, more. Maybe yeah. Ben, I hope that answers your question on that, but I'd love so. to hear more. If you find any more where there's clear differences, we can always do a show later, like showing those. And then the final yeah, super totally. chat we had, 
Um, AFD, thank you for the super chat. He says, have you ever heard of the Talmud of J- – it's J. Manuel. I don't know if That's- Manuel – Talmud of J M M A N E U E L. No, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Thank you for the I'm super sorry. chat. <laughs> sorry. No, please continue with this presentation. I'm okay. Okay. So we're just here's here's um, how I see the uh, the the transmission of this uh, this text. The original. The earliest version is preserved in 4Q Deuteronomy J, where B'nai Elohim appears and is understood as the sons of the gods. The Septuagint translator saw that, said, yeah, these are, these are angels, translates that as Angelon Theo, the angels of God. Then at some point, uh, those who were, were copying uh, the text said, you know, this is just, it's its all just too controversial. We need to change the text altogether to reflect something that's not nearly so polytheistic. So we're going to change this to B'nai Yisrael, the sons of Israel. And we know all this. We guessed at all this before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We know it now because of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm. And this is... This is not, this is a fragment, this is a, this is a text, this is a topic that Christian apologists, Christian apologists are loath to talk about. That's but there's more. Can, can I ask you something before you press forward real quick? Yes, sir. Arian, thank you for the super chat. He, he said, tithing to Derek, the son of El Yan. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. My dad is <laughs> proud of me. Um, <laughs> Zachary has a question. He says, okay, Dr. Kip. So in your opinion, are most Christian apologists just being ignorant or dishonest in misrepresenting the Dead Sea Scrolls? And you better get the answer correct or you're going to hell. No, I'm just kidding. So this is this is complicated because I don't know about most. I don't know about how many. I would definitely say there's a spectrum. I think there's plenty of Christian apologists who just repeat talking points that they hear and they know what they know um, and they're they're sincere and what they believe and what they think about this stuff. But then I would say there's also those who spend enough time within the original languages, within the original text, within scholarship, who should know better and continue to to, um, willfully ignore the truth. And we are actually going to get to one of these cases as soon as we're finished with this next Friday. All right, I'm, I'm quiet. And if you super chat me, I'll screenshot it and wait. Unless it's super relevant and it's important to to discuss at that moment. That was a good question, though. Yeah. So there is more. Uh, here is the fragment that appeared at the end of uh, of Derek's intro. This is a fragment from 4Q Deuteronomy Q. Oh, by the way, I was going to mention something interesting about these texts as well. So this this uh, fragment from 4Q Deuteronomy J that you still see on your screen here with the B'nai Elohim. Um, reference in it. So there's there's numerous fragments from this manuscript that that the brilliant editor, uh, Sidney White Crawford, has, has painstakingly pieced together and managed to reconstruct uh, what we believe was originally within this manuscript. And its contents are intriguing. It is originally thought to have contained Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1 to 6, 3, then chapter 8, verse 5 to 10, then chapter 10, verse 12, to 11 verse 21 then exodus chapter 12 verse 43 to uh 13 verse 16 then deuteronomy 32 1 to 9 in that order so i say that uh to to make a point here when you hear people talk about the dead sea scrolls when you hear people talk about copies of bible in the dead sea scrolls very often what they're talking about or what they're not communicating is that there were all sorts of ways in which people cobbled together their scriptures. And this is an example of one of them. Uh, The second fragment that you see on the left-hand side of your screen, this is 4Q Deuteronomy Q. Um, And this manuscript 
most likely contained only the Song of Moses, which appears in Deuteronomy chapter 32. How do we know this? Uh, the very narrow, short columns consisting of only 10 lines. It measures from top to bottom, 11.4 uh, centimeters. It's like this big. It's really small. Um, it suggests this because when you're dealing with something this small, if you wanted to copy out the entire text of Deuteronomy, you'd have a scroll that was like 100 feet long, and that's just far too unwieldy. So when it's small like that, you know that it's a it's it's a it's a smaller text. It's a smaller manuscript. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Cool. And I want so, to see the controversy because obviously this is a very controversial area. This is well. a very controversial one. So um, here and the other thing I really like about this fragment, um, the the column is really really narrow, and the reason for that is because Deuteronomy thirty two is a poem and it's constructed in the the standard way in which uh in, in which your poetry um the the i guess i guess the standard structure of hebrew poetry which is in in uh parallel statements and we call this parallelism most commonly it's just just two uh, parallel statements which which essentially uh reflect or expand upon one another sometimes it goes Sometimes there's three, uh, but generally speaking, it's two. And the way that the scribe has penned this text, he's put each individual sticko on its own line, which is really cool. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 43. And what you see here is six lines of text, which contains the entire verse. Um, here is my English translation of this verse and derek you're going to want to put a thumb on this in okay. your uh in your heresy bible i got praise the uh, niv yeah good yes praise oh heavens his people bow down before him all you gods for he will avenge the blood of his sons and take vengeance on his adversaries he will repay those who hate him and cleanse his people's land. Now, I've, I've highlighted a number of the English words in red. These are problematic words which appear differently in our English translations of this verse. Uh, why don't you read what you've got there, Derek? My English says rejoice and look at look at his passage, right? Look at the words he has and compare it to what I'm saying. Yeah. Rejoice, you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for his land and people. I bet that everybody who is watching this now is completely lost based on what you read because it sounds totally different it is totally so, different. what's going on here um here is the yes here's the the masoretic text and uh the really problematic the 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 two big changes that they made well i guess no there's there's multiple big changes they made isn't there but um uh, the the two changes to the actual words they made appear on the first line at the end of the the second line. So, again, I would suggest that the Masoretic text reflects a later tradition when uh, the 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 uh, the Jews have moved far beyond polytheism and were loath to. Um, to tolerate any kind of insinuation of polytheism in their text. So what did they do? They just changed the text in an effort to try and get rid of it. So um, I'm going to go through step by step what I think happened with this particular verse. First of all, as I mentioned, this is a very neatly structured poem uh, which consists of three sets of uh, parallel statements. Praise, O heavens, his people. 
Bow down before him, all you gods. For he will avenge the blood of his... Oh, no. Shoot. Rats. What? I went too fast. Can I go back? It's okay. Yep. Yeah. Oh. I hope you can. Let's see if I could go. Oh, no. I went too far. Now we're did in trouble. You? Okay. I did. So, um, Derek, we fine. need a commercial. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, you have a parallelism. Oh, you heavens and sons of God, or if you will, they're the same people. These are gods that are bowing down to El Elyon here in particular. And this is in Deuteronomy 32. Um, the, the, the controversy boils down to Christians will say, well, this is one fragment. I've already heard this from Jewish apologists, including Christian apologists. This is just a one in a... Uh, <laughs> that scribe was smoking crack back in the third century BC. Uh, <laughs> ignore that passage. It has no relevance. Everyone goes with the other Masoretic version because we've had the same Bible ever since and someone's trying to trick you, blah, 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 blah. My point is, this might be an earlier, more authentic to its origins text. Why wouldn't it be? Like, who would invent this later on? It just makes no sense. So uh, we got the conspiracies out of the way. I hope, um, I hope yeah, we're back we're from good. our commercial okay, break. Okay, I think okay, we're back okay. on track. So first, parallel, first set of, uh, of parallel statements. Praise, O heavens, all his people. Bow down before him, all you gods. So, Which, oh, his people, oh, heavens, his people, that's sky, think up. Those yes. are where the gods live. So, yes. the heavens are not humans on earth, these are gods in the sky. And he repeats it, it's a parallelism, a poem. Bow down saying, to all him. you gods, yeah, all you gods, for he will avenge the blood of his sons. Who do you think this is with reference to? I, I mean, this I is. This is the king of the god avenging the blood of whom? Yeah, that's what I want to know. I want to ask you. So, and take vengeance on his adversaries. Who is Who are the enemies of the king of the gods? Like these are, you're right. These are, these are the questions that we, we should be asking. I would suggest to you, especially in the way in which the, uh, the later scribe has edited this text i would suggest that the blood of his sons is actually with reference to the sons of god the b'nai elohim the uh the minor lesser divine beings within the heavenly council because they the council could of, die they, there Elf. was from what i understand these deities were not immortal uh this is not this in is the way that yeah not in the way that we think of it no Right. Um, and there's and there's you know, we see we see gods passing essentially gods die by by passing out of out of favor, passing out of existence, or they get they get defeated and eliminated by <clears throat> excuse me, by rivals. Okay. So I would say that's what's going on here. The third set of parallel statements, he will repay those who hate him and cleanse his people's land. So very neat, very tidy poetical structure. Um, a scribe looked at this and said, this will not do. We cannot have other gods, even if they are bowing down to the great king of the gods, Yahweh. So, and here are our parallel. Yes. Okay. Alpha, beta, alpha, beta structure throughout. Okay. Now we're back on track. Cannot have... God's bowing down even to the king of the gods, Yahweh, because as we know, there is only one God. Uh, first of all, change heavens to nations and just get rid of that second parallel stanza. But there's a problem here. Get rid of What's the first happened? beta. Yeah. So what has happened now once you've eliminated that? It's alpha, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. So now you don't have yeah. the poem is not you've, the parallelism isn't going to work. You've totally destroyed the poetical structure. And look here again. He changed blood of his sons to blood of his servants. And this suggests to me that the understanding of the scribe who was copying this text saw that blood of his sons uh, as a reflection 
of the old the old views of the divine council of the family of god so he's got to do something else here to fix this and i think it's rather brilliant so he he takes away that fourth line and now we have a new structure and it's actually a pretty clever one instead of a b a b we can now see, or alpha beta alpha beta we can now see this as alpha beta beta alpha in the first stanza we have people in the second stanza we have vengeance in the third stanza we have vengeance and in the fourth stanza we have people he's taken uh, a standard parallelism and turned it into a chiasm rather brilliantly um and i mean this is this is the kind of illustration that we have of how smart these people were too I know that uh, that oftentimes and 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 the uh, the caricature uh, the straw man is developed. I hear particularly from apologists when they when they try to counter um, views with regards to the construction of the Pentateuch or with uh, the the source theories that uh, you know we as scholars must think that all the all the scribes and all the all, all the writers in antiquity were a bunch of idiots who couldn't see this stuff. Right. It's the total opposite. These people were brilliant. They did amazing, clever, thoughtful, brilliant things to, you know, turn what eventually became a, a heresy into this. So, and we know this. The, the only reason we know this is because of this, this wonderful fragment from I think uh, the in, Dead Sea Scrolls. I, I must add, for all of those who think we're hating on the bible you know there's only oh. ignorance i'm gonna say it i gotta be bold here you are ignorant and i say that because what we're actually trying to do is show you your book that you worship and believe and follow and such to a point because i used to do it i was a, i was very hardcore fundamental christian and make you realize this is a piece of literature an ancient near eastern piece of literature similar to the other ancient Near Eastern pieces of literature. We're not trying to downplay how brilliant this literature is. We're trying to say what you in the 21st century, really later on, have developed in your perception about these texts are mistaken. So get rid of your magical yeah. woo-woo, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, perfect uh, um, uh, position based on these texts and start looking at them like all other humans look at all other literature. This is our critique. Our critique is to say, this is not perfect. It wasn't written in the handprint of God on a golden tablet handed to a man named uh, Joseph Smith or Muhammad. You know, this wasn't sent down from heaven perfect as is, or God perfectly had the scribes make every perfect statement. That whole fantasy about the text is what we're jabbing at. And we're trying to show you, these are humans that are really, really smart. I mean, far smarter than I am in terms of literature. At the same time, they're way back then. Some of this stuff needs to stay as literature and read that way, not practiced today. We, we get into all that stuff later. Like Dr. Josh, we talk about genocide. We talk about slavery. We talk about, well, slavery wasn't slavery. They were all working from nine to five. Uh, get out of here. Do you, you know, that's the stuff we have problems with. So anyway, yep. please continue. Preach it, Derek, son of Elyon. Hamarashima Baba. <laughs> okay so this <laughs> is I, maybe this is, chat. this is a good time probably to take a take a take a breath okay and uh we can go through some of some of these super chests that you've collected to this point because um from here i'm going to shift gears and i'm going to start talking about uh i'm going to talk about two manuscripts um and uh and and how apologists have abused them in okay. uh in the uh uh, uh, in their preaching on the fulfillment of prophecy. So, okay, we're going to bang this out because I only got two that we haven't discussed. One of them was uh, a super chat, and I said thank you to the person. Let's see if it's still available. It's not available. There's too many chat. Oh, I hate that about no. this thing, man. YouTube's got to step their game up. They were trying to say, can you start over? Because they missed the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
So yeah, I'm just, yeah. So anyway, uh, no, thank you. Uh, but this video is saved, so you can always come back to this video and watch it from the beginning. And I hope you enjoy the intro. I am sorry for being bold and blunt, but I'm not sorry because I'm seriously a little bit flustered about um, that ignorance there about what we're trying to do here. You're just trying to jab. No, we're trying to show you you don't know what you're reading. That's all we're trying to do. And I'm going to say nobody spends their entire life uh, studying the text of the Hebrew Bible unless they're madly in love with the text of the Hebrew Bible. So and I mean, I, scholars, they'll say we're haters, though. They'll say you're a hater of God because you're pointing out these I, things. Uh, you I know what I'm love saying. it. I love it. It is my muse. <laughs> well, uh, I saw a video where you were actually in the background, um, at, like where an actual Dead Sea Scroll was, and you looked uh, way younger than you do now, man. What's up with that? <laughs> you saw that. <laughs> I did. I thought you had the Utnapishtian uh, plant or something uh, that you were supposed to preserve your age. It obviously hasn't no. worked so well. So, Yeah, no. I, <laughs> no. So um, I'm actually th – that's actually a nice – that's going to be a nice segue into, into what we're moving on to because um, in 2005 – uh, when I was a first year PhD student, I was invited by uh, by one of my mentors, Professor Peter W. Flint, uh, who was working with Eugene Allwork from the University of the Notre of University of Notre Dame, on publishing uh, the two large Isaiah scrolls from Cave One in uh, Qumran, and he invited me to come along with him for a week to uh, go to Israel and to help him out. While they were doing, while they were taking measurements, and while they were uh, uh, checking um, uh, some of the the, the scribal uh, features of the manuscript and the actual condition, or sorry, manuscripts and the conditions of them themselves, so it was an amazing opportunity, and I actually got to sit for a week in the vault at the Israel Museum with the actual manuscripts, the ones that you see on this, the, the Great Isaiah Scroll, so-called because it's it's a fully intact copy of the entire book of Isaiah uh, from probably about 100 BCE, um, and that's the new dating. Uh, I know mm. most will say 150, but it's it's probably more comfortably 100. Um, <clears throat> the, the one that's on display there in the shrine of the book in the Is this in the, the one on the video? Is, that you uh on? yeah yeah i'm gonna share so it. that I, one I, on I, the I, that one on the video is the original the okay. one on display is a replica okay I'm sharing it's a, the video it's a just to show everybody. so all right okay so there just it is a sneak peek let's see dr kip like 30 years <laughs> younger hold on no <laughs> I'm come on I'm, exagger I'm exaggerating i did that on purpose i'm just jabbing at you man just take a joke it's okay Hold on. So look, cool. here we go. No, I think it's I think it's coming up here. Those in the comfort of their can you own hear homes, that? And then they come here to double check what they I can read. hear it. Okay. Now I'm gonna skip ahead. Let's see you look at you in the background right that's, here. Hold on. This guy. That's Professor on. Flint. What is work constant? Look at there you. He is. Holy smokes, look at that young guy. <laughs> he ate of the tree of life then. Did you get kicked out of the garden? I'm just kidding. No, seriously, oh, look at your hair, man. You, you still got long hair. Um, let's get a better one of you here uh da, 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 da. real quick here okay here we yeah. go here we go this is this look at this stud with this cross bro you were representing we the addition that's come bro. to us has been remarkably well look at you huge differences critical differences the oh my heat. god you're, you're you look like this you belong is, here this is my uh this is my my um my uh my projected self here this is look, this is the me that shows up in my own dreams so, Seriously though, man, you look like you're ready to fight for the Lord right there. I, at that time, I probably was. Dude, so, you, you look this, like it. So I was going the, at, while we were doing this. This crazy thing happened where this 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 television producer from Canada happened to be in town and wanted to talk to uh, Professors Flint and Professors Ulrich about um, about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so he came with his camera crew into the vault, and, and we shot that bit. Um, 
so I, I found I, well, after finding this, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd post the clip online just because I was I thought, man, this is so crazy. It's been so long since that happened, and my God, look what happened to me. But well, that um, was on your channel for anyone who's wanting to go watch yes, this. Yes, it's on so Doctor Kip's channel. You can just watch the whole clip. But I was going to say, as soon as I posted that, uh, within ten minutes, I received a I received a note from a colleague of mine in Norway, and he was absolutely furious because when you sit down and you watch and listen to what uh, Professor Flint and Professor Ulrich say in that television broadcast, it's it's Christian apologetics 101. Wow. And the the astonishing, maybe per, perhaps this is one of the, the, the most astonishing things to me um, in my time there and the week that I, I spent there with them was just how fundamentally different the 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 little blurb that they did for this television show was from all of the discussions all of the scholarly discussions that we were having about these texts you know as we were working on uh on preparing this volume um so dr kip real real quick before because yeah. i want to see this clip you're going to play if you want to share it you're more than welcome to so, share it i'd like to watch it but we did get a super chat, servant of the most high. Thank it. you for the super chat. He says, I have said you are gods. Now, does that play into this theme of the is Elohim that, and whatnot in Jesus? I expect day? so. And this is this is I don't know. It's I don't know the original passage offhand. It's it's one of the Psalms. Um I'd have to I'd have to look it up uh in order to see uh clearly. But I suspect this is exactly what's going on here. Interesting. And since we have like so. 470, 480 total people from YouTube and Facebook, please, while you're watching, hit the like and go subscribe to Dr. Kip right now. You're going to see Apologist 101 here in just a second. Uh, so. Did you want to comment on that before you share it? Or, or? So, yes, I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to. Let's. Okay. So, um. One of the ways, perhaps, I, I mean, you hear apologists, you hear Christian apologists talk about, like I said, how many manuscripts of the Dead Sea Scrolls, how old the manuscripts of the Dead Sea Scrolls are. And by the way, this is this is a big deal. Uh, before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the oldest copy of the Hebrew, like the oldest complete copy of the Hebrew Bible is the Leningrad Codex or sorry, the Aleppo Codex, which is a little bit older than the Leningrad Codex, but not quite complete. But these two are manuscripts that date to about 900 and 1,000 uh, CE. So the Dead Sea Scrolls date between 300 to about 100, 300 BC to about 100 AD. So you're looking at taking the text back easily over 800 years over a thousand years in some instances so it is a huge deal and you can understand why christian apologists are going to promote this point over and over again they also like to talk a great deal about how close the uh the the text is to our preserved hebrew cop like the the masoretic text from on which our english translations are all based as i said before um but i think maybe the one of the most famous uh, Dead Sea Scroll arguments for apologists is what's going on in Psalm 22. And uh, I, I assume many of your viewers will recognize Psalm 22 as the, famously as the Psalm that uh, Jesus quotes from when he, uh, he is crucified on the cross. And it's also uh, a Psalm which is, is um, forwarded as proof of uh, the fulfillment of prophecy with how closely it appears to align with uh, what happened to Jesus in his passion. So I'm going to show a clip here of Professor Peter Flint, and this is the man who invited me to go to Israel with him. He was a dear, dear friend. He passed away in 2017 rather suddenly. Um, he was a terrific scholar. Um, and uh, uh, a tremendous mentor of mine. I know Jim Jim West is probably going to get really mad at me for, for showing this this video clip because those of us who uh, met Peter uh, met Pre Professor Flint. Uh, 
I mean, I can only say good things about him. He was an amazing man. He was a good scholar. Um, he he believed passionately in what he, he was doing, and he loved it. But in many respects, he was he was deeply um, informed and guided or misguided by his own um, prejudices about the text, even coming to the text beforehand. So I'm just going to share my screen and play. It's about a five-minute clip of, um, of, of a talk that he did a few years before he passed away at an event that was put on by Josh McDowell, uh, Josh McDowell Ministries and Campus Crusade for Christ, called uh, Discover the Evidence. So just bear with me for a moment while I share my screen. Can you answer a question while you do that? Yes, sir. All right. Ben Ben has another uh, doozy. So be prepared. Oh. What, what do the Dead Sea Scrolls have to say about archangels? Collins believes Daniel has Michael, the book of Daniel, has Michael as the rider on the clouds, a title usually reserved for Yahweh. Do you see this mm -hmm. on the screen behind me? So this is a this is a copy of uh one of one of the copies of a manuscript known as the war scroll from Qumran this is the oldest copy and in this copy is and and also in uh in in the the complete copy known as as 1QM it came from cave 1 there is there Michael the archangel makes an appearance and he is um yeah he's he's essentially i would say i think what what ben is probably uh getting at here is that by this stage at this point in time um because they're still reading these 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 same texts with with this this uh competition that's now been tremendously diluted between yahweh and his his counterparts in the um in the council of the gods and usurping the uh king of the gods l um, in many of these passages, Michael comes to assume that that lesser deity image that Yahweh used to occupy. And 1QM and this one here, 4QMA, uh, are tremendously interesting texts which show uh, how important Michael was in the minds of, uh, of Second Temple Jews. Mm. Interesting. Okay. I'm ready when Here you we are. Go. Can we get, can we get 100 more likes? Get us 100 more likes. we oh. got 500 people watching you, Dr. Kip. No pressure. Awesome. <laughs> None. <laughs> so here is Professor Peter Flint talking about Psalm 22. My friends, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls and other scrolls we're hearing about at this conference. The biblical scrolls are up to 1,250 years older than the traditional Hebrew Bible, the Masoretic text. I kid you not. We had, we were using a 1,000 year old manuscript to make our Bibles. We've now got scrolls going back to 250 BC. So now here is the million dollar question. When we take the biblical scrolls and we compare them with our Hebrew Bible, right? Maybe you've Maybe you've had this experience. Someone has visited you at your doorstep and said to you, your Bible's full of errors. And you say, no, look, it's not. And he says, well, the church and the rabbis messed with it and your Bible's been changed. <clears throat> now we take <clears throat> our Bibles, compare them with the Dead Sea Scrolls. When our Bibles are compared with the biblical scrolls, what is our conclusion? Our conclusion is simply this. The scrolls confirm the accuracy of the biblical text. Now, I'm going to say 99%, but we'll come to that. The Dead Sea Scrolls confirm the accuracy of the biblical text. You know Psalm 22, do you not? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the psalm that Jesus cried on the cross. Remember? There's even the psalm, uh, they have cast lots for my clothes. 
Is he preaching right? to a he's, choir? Like in to the a, gospel, uh, Psalm relates to the crucifixion. Well, there's um, a very interesting it's verse. It's a seminar. In Psalm 22. Okay. In the King James. Dogs have surrounded me. A pack of evil ones close in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Now, you know this verse, and you would say this affirms for me crucifixion. Well, did you know that, in fact, if you took this verse and spoke to a rabbi or even a Bible scholar, they would say, not so fast. Because if you turn to the very Hebrew Bible that you use, your own Hebrew Bible, the Biblia Hebraica, you would be quite shocked, as I was, to discover it doesn't say that. The Hebrew Bible used by all churches today says, dogs surround me, a pack of evil ones clothing on me, like a lion on my hands and feet. Now, some would say, you see, the church has messed with the text. They wanted to put Jesus in that text. They ignored the Hebrew, and they put their pierced my hands and feet. That is a great challenge. But my friends, I've got good news for you. This passage is preserved in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I know what I'm talking about because I am the editor of the scroll. And there it is. There it is. The Nachal Cheva Psalm Scroll. And it contains this passage. And there it is. Uh, I'm pausing this here because uh, those three fragments that he showed on the screen, importantly, uh, not one of them is the actual fragment that he's speaking about here. And I think there's a good reason for that. And uh, we'll get to it when we, when we take a look at the actual fragment. But just bear that in mind. Okay. It's in the Hebrew, my dear friends, what does it say? In the oldest copy of Psalm 122 in the world, dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil one has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Isn't that amazing? Hallelujah. There you have, in the oldest copy of Psalm 22 in the world, the reading that, that the liberal critics and the scholars, many said, this was a fake. This was put in by the church. And there it is in the oldest copy in the Hebrew itself. There we go. Wow. I almost got okay. like converted. No, I'm just kidding. Go, go, go ahead. Take it. Take he's us a, into the dilemma here because he's a preacher, right? Yes. So I hope I, I don't know if. Um, okay. So yeah, I will. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to share my screen again just so that no I problem. can pull up my PowerPoint. And this Alrighty. was your mentor when you were wearing that wooden cross. This right? was. Yes. Yes, that was uh, that was Peter Flip, my mentor. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna jump back into this and shift some gears here. So what what Professor Flint is saying is that um, the the Psalm twenty two verse seventeen verse sixteen in the English that uh, that is often cited by Christians as uh, as a fulfilled prophecy of Jesus's crucifixion where it says, uh, wild dogs, ah. rabid dogs have surrounded me. When you said um, dogs, your dog barked. It's a sign. <laughs> They're surrounding it's a, me. It's a sign. <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Wild That's dogs. Okay. <laughs> rabid go dogs have, have surrounded me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Um, this is based on a Greek translation of this psalm. Uh, and it was, it was used by the Christians as a way of, uh, uh, illustrating the inerrancy of the text by way of fulfilled prophecy. The idea here is that, uh, the entire Psalm 22 was written by David and, uh, uh, written as a, a, a prophetic expectation of what would happen to Jesus Importantly, with the uh, with 
a, uh, a visual illustration of crucifixion. And many Christians, I've seen S.J. Uh, Thomason talk about this several times. Uh, importantly, this psalm supposedly, you know, was written prior to the invention of crucifixion by the Persians in, I think, the 4th century uh, B.C. So here, um, if true, this would stand as a, a pretty tremendous, uh, pretty remarkable uh, passage in light of, uh, of, of um, what happened to Jesus. And if you read the whole psalm, oftentimes Christians will read the whole psalm and say, look, look at all this stuff. Peter Flint talked about it in his video. You know, they divided my clothes with lots. Look at all this stuff that, that, that happens within the psalm that happened to Jesus. He cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a citation of the, of the psalm. So this is what's at issue here. And what Professor Flint has said is that there is a copy of this psalm in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which preserves this reading that we know from the Septuagint. Um, and is different from the traditional Hebrew text, which actually reads, instead of, they pierced my hands and my feet, it actually reads, like a lion, my hands and my feet. And I will get into, into how we see the differences and, and how that difference takes place. Are we all on the same page? Yes. Okay. So. Can I get 508 people to say yes? Yes. yes. Okay. Everyone. Good. All right. Um, they need to appoint a federal head. The 508 viewers amongst yourself appoint a federal head to, to, uh, sorry, I'm making There's a bet. 513 now. And I think that's oh, how no. many commandments are in the Bible, right? Isn't it? Isn't there it's, like 513? Give, give or take a hundred or so. I don't know. It's yeah. close, right? Yeah. Who's yeah, yeah. who's counting really? Okay, me. <laughs> I want to. I want to. I think I've got. Uh, I've got four points here. Okay. First of all, he says that he says in his talk, uh, speaking of uh, of the fragment from the Nachal Hever scroll, that this is the uh, the oldest copy of this passage, which is not true. It's not the only ancient copy of this famous passage from the Judean desert. There's another fragment, and I believe you see this on your screen, yes? Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's another fragment from this manuscript. This is 4Q Psalms F, numbered 4Q88. Remember what I said about how we number the scrolls or how we, how we catalog them based on their canonical order? Um, so this is a small fragment from a psalm or from maybe a small collection of psalms. Um, it's quite old. I've suggested about 150 BCE. Um, the hand is what I would also classify as a, it's a semi-cursive, which means you know, we understand the difference between uh, block letters and cursive writing. Cursive is like we learned handwriting in school and block letters are like, uh, you know, typeset letters. Right. I don't know how else to to explain. The same thing occurs in in Hebrew, although and although it's it's what we call a semi-cursive text, which is which is more of like a fluid uh, formal hand. Um, the lettering is very small. Uh, this suggests to me that this was a manuscript that was not used in public performances. This was not used by a large community. Maybe belonged to just an individual. So this particular fragment that you see on your screen uh, contains the passage in question. Um, and this manuscript was also uh, edited by Professor Peter Flint. And I think there's a good reason why he didn't bother to bring this particular fragment up. So here is how he has uh, reconstructed the, the, uh, the passage in question. Um, where you see the square brackets, anything inside the square brackets is what we call a lacunae or text that is missing, uh, text that is, has, has disappeared with the ravages of time. So um, 
Here's the translation of what appears on the screen. Dogs surround me because, you know, you always begin with the verb in Hebrew. The verb's not there. So it's, I've, I've included that in, in just uh, um, round brackets. A gathering of wicked ones encircle me. And Professor Flint has, transla has translated this. They pierce my hands and my feet. Keru rade uregle. Okay. And here in his edition is what he has to say about this particular manuscript. The manuscript may well have had the grammatically correct reading, keru, with uh, here we have multiple Masoretic manuscripts and editions, and the Septuagint, that's what those Gothic symbols mean. The Mater Lectionis. This is a fancy Latin term, meaning vowel letter. So a vowel letter was inserted in keru, and it became this word here, which is keru, but with uh, with an alpha, which is is just, um, I mean, uh, Hebrew is a consonantal language. Um, and at, there, but there are some consonants which um, later scribes used as vowel letters to aid in the pronunciation of things. So he says, a vowel essentially was inserted in Keru by uh, this manuscript that, uh, or by the, the manuscript that he mentioned, 5 6 Hever Psalms, by multiple Masoretic manuscripts, and the Masoretic, or sorry, the Leningrad uh, Codex, which preserves the Masoretic tradition, probably misread the final letter, which is a Vav for a Yod, thus rendering it. Uh, ka -i, which otherwise translates as like a lion. So the question here is this word. Is it keru, meaning they dug or they hollowed out, or is it ka'are, like a lion? So this is his explanation here. Are you with me so far, Derek? I, I, I'm, I'm tracking... I'm tracking. I know this already okay. went back and forth. I just don't know the conclusion, though. I'm interested All right. to see what you say. So what, what Professor Flint is doing here is he's constructing a similar textual history to what we pointed out in the above examples with Deuteronomy chapter 32. Um, however, problematically, his construction is founded on the flimsiest of evidence. So what, I, what I've included here is the best photograph of this fragment that I believe is in existence. Um, yes. It, it so it's in black and white. Well, it, the reason it's in black and white is because it's infrared. Right. Um, okay. If okay. the, the, if it was in color, you wouldn't be able to read it at all. Um, because of, because of the inks, they, uh, they don't show up on the color. You have to, you have to look at the infrared spectrum in order to actually see the writing, which is why oftentimes when you'll see, Fragments of Dead Sea Scrolls fragments on on my uh, on my big computer monitor behind me. They're always in black and white because I work with with infrared photographs. Excuse and what me. verse is this? Uh, so what you see here is um, the verse in question would be verse sixteen in the English. It's verse seventeen in the Hebrew. In Psalms twenty-two, okay. you got. It. Psalms 22, verse 16, I'm just looking at it here. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has, has uh, enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. That's the New King James Version that I just read. Okay, so um, here I've added some numbers to the lines to help us help us keep track of what's, what's taking place on the fragment. The verse in question... Verse 16 appears on lines 7 and 8. So on line 7, I see very clearly uh, dogs. Uh, the dogs are surrounding me. The verb is, is missing in the line above. Uh, the, the congregation, the gathering of the mard, what the, the first two letters of the wicked ones is there at the end of line 7. Uh, they encircle me and the encircle me is this these first little scratches at the bottom of the fragment on line eight 
Now, I'm pretty confident of the existence of this word. Here, I can see a hey at the beginning. Then I can see a kof and a yod and a pay and a noon and a yod. Just based on, on the remaining traces there, I feel pretty good about that. Even though I know to you and probably to the viewers, you're looking at this going, those look like spots of ink. Um, they actually communicate a little bit more than that. Um, but what's really, really troubling here is what he does with the following word. The following word is the problematic word. The following word is the one we either render uh, keru, they pierced, or ka'are, like a lion. What do you see here? So at the very bottom, you see there's like, can I, I can't get my, I can't get my cursor up, unfortunately. Um, I wish I we could, see, and I wish I could point. Oh, do you see, see my cursor? Yeah, we could see I it, yes. <laughs> I don't see my cursor. We this do. sucks. You don't have eyes. Well, that's to see not helpful at all. I do not. So, um, <laughs> the point I want to make here is I, so if you look at the very bottom of this fragment, mm -hmm. and starting on the left side, if you kind of track to the right, you can see two tiny little dots just at the very bottom of the fragment. Right, right. You can, can you use your those? cursor. You put your cursor right on it. I'm telling you, we could see I, your cursor. Shut up, man. This is not helpful. So <laughs> do you see the dots, though? Yes, there's two dots, and it's kind of sl sloping down. We see two yeah. little just dots, and then yes. you have something that goes higher, of course, after that. So this is the problematic word. This is kairu. And for the life of me, I have no idea how he's reading that from what's preserved here. There is almost nothing here. And I hope you can see that there is almost nothing here. Yeah. Okay. Two polka dots. Little ding, ding. Two polka dots. So here, we're either, the reading, like I said, is either ka'are, which is the one on the left, like a lion, or Keru, they dig or they hollow out. So, um, hold on, I'm just getting back. I got, I got, all right. Uh, so the verb here that Flint has reconstructed as Keru, it means to dig or to hollow out, but he translates it as to pierce. All that is visible of this word on the photograph is two very small ink traces, which belong to, at most, the tops of two letters. So I would say it's unsurprising that he didn't talk about this manuscript at all in his talk, because despite the confidence he portrays in this video, there's almost nothing here. Okay? Right. But, but this brings us to oh and here yes so this is this is the translation that he has that he has provided that he has supplied so secondly the word that flint wishes to read as keru is supposedly a lengthened form of the word um yeah of of the verb uh i've mentioned this before here's the way that he wants to to uh oops i it's you I, did I it. messed up the the letter order there though trust me though um this is this is the this is what he wants to read here almost except for my typographical error that all the hebraists in your audience are going to to um unsubscribe to me because of um so this is this is the the what he wants to read they pierced my hands and my feet um this keru with the the second letter there is called an aleph, is a lengthened form of keru uh, to the right, and that letter there is supposedly just a just a vowel letter. It's just carrying the vowel sound. So, and this certainly happens in the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
Uh, the Hebrew language is exclusively consonantal, but there are a handful of so-called vowel letters, what he calls mater lakshonas. Uh, these are, uh, excuse me, <coughs> aleph, bav, yod, ayin. And they appear in a number of early Jewish texts. And they're thought to have been aids to reading. I have to, my throat's getting scratchy here. Sorry, guys. It's all good. They're, they're, um, the lines are encircling your throat and they pierced <laughs> your Adam's apple. Yeah. You know, it's all it's good. A miracle. Don't worry. It's a miracle. Okay. It's a miracle. All right. Um, yes. Unfortunately, there is no attestation of this form for this word anywhere. Moreover, the translation that Flint has chosen is incredibly awkward. This word appears elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, and it is always translated completely differently. Here, Genesis 26, verse 25. Isaac pitched his tent there, and his, started, his servant started digging a well. Exodus 21, 33. When a man opens a pit or digs a pit. Numbers 21, 18. The well that the leader sank and the nobles of the people dug. Jeremiah eighteen twenty the evil is a is evil a payment for good see they have dug a pit for my life Psalm seven sixteen they make a pit digging it out Psalm fifty seven six they dug a pit in my path you see what you see a pattern developing here mm -hmm. Proverbs twenty six twenty seven whoever digs a pit will fall into it Second Chronicles six fourteen. They buried him in the tomb he had hewn out or dug for himself. So what we see here is that the word that Flint wants to translate as pierce doesn't ever mean pierce as in like stabbing someone or puncturing the, the flesh. So there is, there is one instance in Psalm verse 40, in a poetical text where it has a, a an uh, elusive metaphorical sort of usage, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, you have bored or dug or hollowed my ears as a way to create an opening, right? Now, I suspect Flint is channeling this, this particular psalm here in his own, uh, in his own translation. Um, in order to, to to get to his. But even this is a huge stretch, I would suggest, to get to they pierced my hands and my feet. So all that to say, I don't like the translation. We good? Yeah. I, look, man, I'm not going to argue with you, okay? Okay. Uh, I'm just not going <laughs> to do it. All right. Third point. Okay, and here I'm just going to... I'm going to show the photographs now of the fragment, okay? okay? All right. So I'm just going to pull these up. Uh, we'll look at this one first. So this this is the fragment in question, okay? Okay. Now, you'll notice, unlike some of the other fragments that you have seen today, uh, how does that writing look to you? Uh, that's kind of hard to see. It's hard to see, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to zoom in here. Uh, by the way, you can see all the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments online at uh, the Leon Livy Digital Dead Sea Scrolls Library. So I'm going to zoom in here on where the problematic word is. Um, I mean, it's even hard for me to, to find it. So here we go. Here's what Professor Flint is looking at. You, you can see my cursor now, right? Yes. Okay. So here We is, could see hey, it before. You couldn't see I know, it, I think. I know. I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I am uninitiated. Okay. So here is, hey, that's clear to me. Kof, that's clear to me. Yod, that's clear to me. Pei, that's clear to me. Um, there's a bov here, which this is what we would call a mater lakshonis because it's... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So... So this is a vowel letter. 
Uh, but that's clear to me. There's a noon here. That's clear to me. There's a yod here. That's clear to me. So this is the word before the problematic word. Here is the problematic word. And I got to tell you, I struggle to see this. I mean, I can, I can kind of make out a cough here with my cursor. This looks actually pretty clearly to me to be an al aleph. And there's a resh here. But the, the problematic letter in this word is the final one, which is here. And it's tough to see. It's very, very, very difficult for even me, someone who stares at Dead Sea Scrolls fragments all day, every day, and has been doing so for like a couple decades now, I can barely make this out. So I would say right off the bat, this is this is a problematic reading. But I have a slightly better picture of the same fragment here. So this is, oh, I can even zoom in more. That's good. Here, it looks a little clearer, okay? I'm going to zoom in right on the word as best as I can. That's as close as I can get, but I'll show it to you here. Here is the cough tracing with my cursor. Mm -hmm. Here is the... Aleph, tracing with my cursor. Here is the resh. And here is what Peter is reading as the vav, as opposed to the yod. Best picture there is of this fragment. Um, I would still say, mm, maybe, maybe so, it's there. So can I, can I jump to a conclusion here and get your thoughts on something? Yeah. Based on you showing the other evidence throughout the Psalms and just even the Hebrew Bible period, it's used to usually mean or every every time to mean dug, dig, you know, hollow out something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas you show the one example about the ears, but that doesn't mm -hmm. he's not literally saying, hey, let me come over here and drill a hole in the side of your head so you can hear. Um, it's obvious that mm -hmm. th this is some metaphor for saying, so you could hear, uh, the metaphor yeah. of even like what we see in Your the New ears Testament. ears are open. Yes. Yep. It's not like exactly. literal hearing. It's, it's, it is literal hearing, but it's hearing of things that matter, kind of like awareness or being consciously aware of something that might come, you know, like I've listened to that song, but it finally gave me meaning. Now I actually hear the song. I think that that's kind of the implication, right. but yeah. Um, I thought it was really good. Uh, Ray Ashima said uh, in the chat, they said, so what you're telling me is King David wasn't crucified uh, in <laughs> Psalms 22, because if we're going to be consistent, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like if we're going to be consistent. Touché. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess what is the problem? If you don't mind slam dunking that here and how do you see this right here? I mean, this, this particular, it, it, it's not clear. Uh, it's not settled right. what this is saying here, but even if it was granted to be what he's saying, isn't his interpretation still strained? It's still strained. I would, I would agree. Um, and so I, I, yeah, let's, uh, so we will, you're on the right track and we're going to move on to this. So okay. my take on this is that most likely we're dealing with a scribal error at some point in the chain of transmission. Okay. So a scribe, and this happens all the time in, uh, in Hebrew manuscripts, the particular scribal error that we're talking about is what's called Vav Yod transference. Uh, the two letters Vav and Yod, um, in particular in early Jewish manuscripts, very often will look almost identical. Um, Flint makes the point of saying with regards to that manuscript that, um, that they're distinct from one another. And I would agree, even though the, the reading of that particular word is very, very difficult to see from the photographs. It's really badly damaged. I would say, I would even accept that that fragment has preserved a vav as opposed to a yod, which would match with what, what Flint sees. So... Here's what we're looking at. Ka'are, a reminder again on the left with the yod at the end versus keru on the right with the vav at the end. 
The first means like a lion. The second one means they dug or they hollowed. So here's a fragment. I just pulled this up from uh, from the same website I mentioned before. This I believe this is a copy of the Book of Tobit. And you, oh, shoot. No, cur I can't see my cursor again. I can. So, but I'll, I know you can. But you don't know where your cursor is. <laughs> it's okay. Is that a piece so, of tape? Did the dummies who uh, got this tape things and they couldn't take the tape oh, back off? Oh, you bet they did. You mm, bet. I, a, I know something a whole, about that. There's a whole other. There's a whole other set of stories here. But I'm just <laughs> going to. If you look, uh, this the second line of this fragment is is the one with with the uh, first complete words. Uh, starting from the right to the left, because that's how Hebrew works. The very first letter there, um, that's Avav. If you count, that's letter number one. If you count one, two, three, four, letter number four, there's a Yod. Okay? In the following word, in the second word, the second letter, one, two, that's Avav. If we drop down a line below, um, so we're on line three now, the first letter... That's a vav. The third letter, that's a vav. In the following word, the first letter is a yod. And then the third letter is a vav. So I think, like, I hope you can see what I'm getting at here. That it's really, really easy to confuse these two letters. Mm. Even for professionally trained scribes in antiquity. And one of the reasons for that is because of what we know about scribes and what we know about literacy in early Palestine, in ancient Judaism. So we know that, and, and the best the best estimates right now are that anywhere from 2 to 4% of the male population of Palestine at around the time of Jesus was literate, meaning that they had some function of being able to read um, at various levels. Okay. Got it. We tend to think that scribes are literate would seem to make sense. Yes. Right. From Not what I always. understand in the ancient world, sometimes writers couldn't, or no readers couldn't write or, or vice versa or something. I can't remember. Writers, sometimes writers couldn't read. And the reason for this is because in order to be uh, a good scribe, you have to be good at, at one particular thing, and that is recognizing letters and being able to write the letters that you recognize. And I mean, we don't have the statistics on this. We do know of a rather famous example of a an Egyptian scribe named uh, Pateus, who was clearly illiterate. Um, and he lived in about 150 uh, CE. So scribes are copying letters. They're copying texts, even if they can read a little bit. I just got back from my holidays. I spent uh, a week mountain biking with uh, with one of my, my good buddies, who is uh, a pastor in a Baptist church. And he's his Greek is pretty good. He's taken a year of Hebrew, so he recognized letters. He recognizes basic syntax. Um, if I gave him like a really difficult uh, passage, a really difficult text of Hebrew, like from Ecclesiastes to copy out, he would do it and probably do a really good job of it. Then if I asked him to read it, he'd be screwed. He could get right. through, you know. So you see what I'm getting at here, right? Yeah, there's a limit Even to... Though even though scribes can copy pretty good and they'll make a few mistakes here and there, there is no guarantee that they are actually reading the stuff that they are copying out, which is how many of these mistakes can occur. So, so if, I may, if I may jab two things in, one thing that can happen is scribes who are copying this, who are illiterate, they cannot read, but they know how to copy they make a mistake in copying, we lose or forget or somehow the past uh, fragments that are being copied are not around and people are now copying these copies from illiterate scribes who copied these versions and now they're kind of creating interpretations based on things that come later 
that have been mistakenly copied by scribes in the past. Does that make sense? I hope that totally. made sense for our totally. audience. So that is something that can that is something that can happen. So and this is what I think happened in this text. Okay, okay. I think that and because it's difficult, and I'll, I'll I'll sort of illustrate next here some of the difficulty. Um, the actual passage reads the the literal English translation of what I think was original reads like a lion, my hands and my feet. So there's no verb in this clause. This is not especially unusual in Hebrew poetry. Oftentimes, they'll you can construct whole sentences without even a verb. I know it's it's crazy stuff. Um, so there's some ambiguity as to what what this text is about or what it means or even how to translate it. I think I believe most most translations say like a lion or uh, like a lion has devoured my hands and feet. Sometimes they say like a lion are my hands and feet, whatever that means. I don't know. Um, but the point here <laughs> is that it's a difficult passage. I think it's possible. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to get to this in a bit. I think that's at the end. But let's. the third point I want to make is that the word itself, ka'are, like a lion, actually makes pretty good sense within this psalm, Psalm 22. If you look at verses 13 to 14, it says, Many bulls surround me. Mighty ones of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths at me. A tearing, roaring lion. Okay, so we already have lions in this passage, in this, in this whole psalm. Verse 17, the one that we're dealing with. Dogs surround me. A pack of evil ones closes in on me. Like a lion, my hands and my feet. Moving further down to verse 20 to 22. But you, Yahweh, be not far off. My strength, hasten to my aid. Save my life from the sword. My precious life from the clutches of a dog. Deliver me from the lion's mouth. From the horns of wild oxen, rescue me. So you see, there's no reason to even think that this is problematic because there's already a thematic continuity established within the psalm around, you know, the the the, the terrible damage that lions can do to, to someone who, who gets in their clutches. So to sum up what happened here, um, here's what I think happened. First, a scribe miscopied uh, Ka'are and wrote Keru, um, probably mistaking a Yod for a Vav. Uh, and this error was then repeated throughout numerous following manuscripts. Who knows how many? Second, the translator of the Septuagint saw one of these miscopied uh, texts, probably. And here's how he translated it. Horaxan heros maokai poros, which literally means they dug my hands and feet. Okay? And it's possible, I mean, I guess it's possible that the, the Septuagint translator might have even got this this messed up translation by reading a, a correct Hebrew text, but also uh, misconstrued the vowel at the end. Okay. And then finally, we have very ambitious, eager early Christians who are steeped in the Hebrew scriptures, primarily via their Greek translations and understood this entire Psalm to resonate with the experience of Jesus on the cross, and they used it to fashion the crucifixion narrative, complete with this odd translation. They mm -hmm. pierced my hands and my feet. So that's what happened. I, I love this. No, no, no. This is beautiful. Go ahead. Yeah. Are we done? I'm done. We're done. Okay. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to super chat them while we wrap things up. I'm taking final questions. If you want to super chat them, feel free to. If not, 
uh, Dr. Kip, we have to do this again. We have to do more of this because you're getting down into like, I think if anyone watched this long, how difficult it is to seriously act like we can have absolute confidence in these things. Like, can you imagine um, if, if multi, like many of these passages that are really difficult to read do have a hinging on one's uh, interpretations that affect their belief? If they're that literal, if they're that strict in their approach, I mean, you're really hinging a lot on that. And for what, 18, 1900 years, we didn't know this yeah. stuff. So everyone's in the dark about these particular things till later on, at least, at least some of these things I'll say. Yeah. So I, I'm going to say, I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing here just to sort of sum up this bit. Um, you saw a clear illustration of Professor Flint behaving like an apologist. Right. Taking and, and really abusing the evidence, abusing the, what's there in the Dead Sea Scrolls to make a very, very poor apologetic point. A very poor argument about the fulfillment of prophecy and about um, the, the accuracy of the Hebrew Bible. What's even worse though with him is that this also made it into um, publication, scholarly oh. publications. And I'll share with you another, another dirty little secret. Um, there's not a lot of Dead Sea Scroll specialists in the world. Um, you know, when we have our, our IOQS meetings, which is the International Organization of Qumran Studies, uh, we number in, you know, there's probably about uh, 250, 300 of us, um, but those are the people who attend conferences. So you double, triple that, I don't know, 2,000 people tops, I'm guessing. So... Um, but there's a lot of there's there's you know tens of thousands of um, Hebrew Bible experts who never look at a manuscript in their entire lives. Um, they just read editions. They read um, yeah they they read editions and they read transcriptions and and they they read the language great. They have a strong understanding of the history. But when they encounter uh, a volume like like uh, that of Professor Flint's where he's talking about these readings in the text. They, they don't bother to go and check it out themselves. And sometimes even if they do, they don't they don't have the kind of training to be able to see what they're looking at. So this is a big problem. Big big problem. There's so many. Ah, there's so many places we could go to the to, in the scriptures, if I could use the term, and find these kind of problems that come up. And I think you brought it brought out some pretty good points about how apologists will use these things, and they're definitive. It's in fact, as soon as he said, "They pierced my hands and my fruit, my feet," the whole audience started. Like I'm talking, and what was that? What How what exciting. did that mean? I understand what that meant more than what you're actually describing. How to try and find out what the text meant? Because that was clear as day what they were trying to do. Is hallelujah? You could tell they were. We saying, knew the answer at the outset. Yes, you and just, now we have the we have the evidence to show us what we always knew. Yes, right, and that yes, one hundred percent. That's apologetics. That's that apologetic. It's starting with what you already believe to be true and drawing the conclusion somehow. And when this expert with the with the credentials says, hey, this is the case, it's we knew it all along. We knew it all along. Thank you for spending two hours explaining to us how we knew it all along, you know, uh, just yeah. going out of the way to prove what they're starting with. My good friend Stephen <clears throat> says, Thanks for the super chat of $6.66. Yes. The Greek term, and I don't even want to butcher it. What is that Greek term there, uh, Dr. Kip? Oruso. In Psalms 22.16 doesn't actually mean pierce my hands and feet. It means dig. And so he's does a Greek the Hebrew guy. term. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so like I said, the, the Greek translator either encountered an already corrupted Hebrew manuscript with this word, and it's a perfectly legitimate translation 
of the Hebrew word, or he misread ka'are and, and, you know, saw that as the verb as opposed to the noun. So, but yes, a, a bad an angel. Was that a bad an angel? It's uh, a bad an a, a bad an ergo. Yeah, absolutely yeah. correct. He is a, 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 a go very a language. Stephen, you are all over this stuff, man. And if it weren't for him, yeah. I wouldn't have had this right here. This is the uh, image that oh, I was going to share. We didn't even get we, to this, did we? We didn't. One of the things. And uh, I'm going to take your super chat down. Thanks for the super chat, man. It always helps me, especially $6.66, the magical numbers. Um, someone's going to take me serious about all this. I've already seen it in the chat, man. Every show I do these little funny little like, and yes, uh, all of you gods hit the like button. It's like, hold on, there's only one God. You're satanic. It's like, bro. Anyway, um, look at this beautiful little chart here he has. And he highlights in, in yellow all the differences and these different versions from the LXX to the Masoretic to the Dead Sea Scroll, exactly what you showed today. And then he also shows how, and I want to say this while we have viewers, the English versions we have, the Bibles that are in the, the uh, chairs at your church or in the, the Gideon Bible at your hotel that people pick up from time to time when they go to a hotel because they're fighting with their wife and they got to read the truth. And they open their Bible and they turn to Deuteronomy 32 and, and they find out, holy moly, every English translation that we have that Christians are depending on omit those things we discussed in Deuteronomy 32, 47. That sound, it's almost a conspiracy in a way of covering up what's actually 43. there. Sorry, 43. But it's like there's legitimate – it's like they don't want um, people to see that. It will affect – because. The Bible interprets the Bible and it's all perfect and it's one message and it's inerrant and it's infallible and God's omniscient and God's, God's omnipresent. And there's no such thing as polytheism or henotheism. They won't even go that far. It's monotheism, one God. And, and now some like Dr. Heiser, he tiptoes those lines as a, a Hebrew scholar and he he's right on the edge, but he's, he's really not. If you listen to him closely, he gets really into it. And I, I should say too. I mean, Heiser is fabulous. Like he is, he is a he is a a, a brilliant guy who has the chops. Like he's he is super legit. Um, yeah. But I've I've known. I and I think. I mean, who are we kidding? We're all we're all guided by our biases, yeah. right? Um. And I'm I, open about I my biases, by the way. So that's the way to be, though, right? I think I think the it's really important that we all recognize the fact that we're all guided by our biases. And yes, like I I read the Bible a hell of a lot differently now than I did, you know, 15 years ago or or, or 20 years ago when I started my uh, my journey uh, mm -hmm. into ministry. Um. And, and a lot of that has to do, you know, not just with the scholarship. I'm, I, I try as hard as I can to just be guided by, by um, the evidence and by, uh, by, by the most, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> I had to show your cross again. Like, you don't believe that he was a Christian? Look at that cross. The that cross was, uh, does not lie. That was a stone cross, and my wife bought that for me. Oh, and then it I stone? lost it. It is stone. It's a beautiful oh. green stone. I lost it though oh. on a. I lost it in the Caribbean Sea. Oh wow! <laughs> but, uh, it's a sad story. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. but uh, no. Um. So, but yeah, like, like, I yeah, I wanna like. I think it's just. I just think it's really, really important that we're that we're forthright about how about where our own biases lie and when we're guided by them i mean and i think scholars will like to say and i tend to believe this is true most of the time that because i, I mean biblical scholars because we're we're you know we're literary critics we're philologists and we're historians um we're trying to operate within those within those within the methods of those disciplines. 
so that's where like that's where my biases are um i take i take the languages very seriously i'm attuned very closely to the grammar and to the syntax mm -hmm. um i'm reading archaeology and i'm reading history and um i'm looking for patterns within the text like the the internal clues within the text that suggest to me i hello this is what i'm talking about this is what the text is about you're talking about I'm, I'm a boot just, I'm, a boot are you're, you you're canadian are you making i had fun to... of my my canadianness <laughs> I had to, man. Oh, that's it was a book so time. Mean. I did something. No, I almost did the uh, Conor McGregor. It was a book time. I, I something like that. I, I, I'm picking on you. Right. Um, not really, because you're probably picking on me when you hear me say it. about. Whoa, whoa, what? Anyway, uh, I seriously, watch too though, much TV. It sounds normal to me. <laughs> I, I, I love this, man. Thank you, Dr. Kip. This is a great presentation. I want to do this again. There's many other areas we can explore, uh, especially totally. with the documentary hypothesis and showing contradictions and how these uh, passages play a part. You are deep into this. I ask everyone to please go subscribe. Let me pull up his channel so you guys know where you're going. It's, it's the pinned comment in this chat right now. You seriously need to check him out. You, you put together some very beautiful um, videos. You spend time actually doing that. Even in our presentation, the PowerPoint type thing you did was really cool. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Go subscribe. I've got the Holy Spirit. You do. You do. Yeah. That's a fact. Um, so I, I do have to make, I, while we're here, I do have to make a plug. Um, yep. So I've, I've uploaded a trailer there for yep. uh, my current project. Who is who is Josh McDowell? Um, I'm working on, and it's an it's it's going to be about a one hour video documentary about uh, Josh McDowell and the insertion of himself into the fabulous and practically unbelievable story of first century Mark and his usage of manuscripts as a way to um, uh, uh, to minister. For Jesus. So this is coming in mid-August. Um, it's right. consuming all of my time right now. This was a nice break for me, by the way. Um, I was happy to I was happy to to step away from that for a minute, but I'm almost done. And uh this this video is actually uh uh being made with funding provided by the University of Achter in Norway Ooh. and the lying pen of scribes. Uh, project on um, manuscript provenance and discovery narratives. So there will be there will be a premiere and there will be an event and there will actually be scholars uh, present for the premiere. We're still working all that out, but uh, I encourage everybody. I hope everybody uh, takes the time to uh, watch for it when it comes out. Real, real quick, who's who's the guy that's doing the voice of Josh McDowell in this? Because I, I, starring I'm Derek Lambert, um, L. L. Yon, get my name right. <clears throat> um, oh, no, I'm, I'm just teasing. Seriously though, uh, oh. I'm excited about that. I got to do a little uh, audios for the voice of Josh McDowell, and um, you you, you make see up fine, Josh McDowell. <laughs> I try. I try. Um, if I might, since you got the plug, it's only fair that I got to plug. Okay. You guys see this you guy right me. here? This is Dr. John J. Collins. Okay. Uh, he is not a joke. If you don't know Hebrew scholarship, if you don't know Old Testament scholarship, and I'm talking guys in the vein of Dr. Kip here. I'm talking about guys in the vein of Dr. Bowen. In fact, Dr. Kip and Dr. Bowen look up to this guy. Like Dr. You, you, Professor sorry. John Collins was one of Peter Flint's examiners at the University of Notre Dame when he was there. Mm. It's a small world. So, well, anyways. if you guys see, this is Dr. He's amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah. All of these are on my Patreon. All of these. They're not on YouTube. These are not accessible right now. Dude. Eventually. What? You see all this good stuff? Uh, Shapiro on Deuteronomy. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I talked to him about, uh, this and he awesome. it's a 20 to 30 minute video um awesome. where he talks about what he thinks is it a forgery or not do we go into i mean elaine pagels there's so many and i've got um 17 videos with dr joshua bowen 
that I did not export onto YouTube tonight because I didn't want to mess up our live, but they will be up in the morning and um, they'll be on the Patreon tomorrow. So if you've considered joining, you can join for as little as $3 a month. You can get a whole year discount at $3 a month. And I, I can't remember. It's like 20 something bucks, something like that. I can't remember exactly how much it is. You get the whole year in advance. So everything I launch, your help supporting doing what I'm doing here. Go subscribe to Dr. Kip's channel. And eventually, whatever else you might need, um, you know, plugging Dr. Kip, let me know. I really love this stuff. You do a lot of anti-apologetics work, but educational stuff based on the hey, Bible. Derek, can we pull up um, can we pull up one of the chats? Do you have more super chats or, or are those done? That's done. Okay, can we pull up a chat? Because I wanna I wanna mention something here. Uh yeah, where? this Munda Munda Skeptical. Uh is it at the bottom or is it just it's look at, up a little? At 2 31 p.m. 2 31? Oh, okay, okay. Hold oh, on. is that way back there? Oh, sorry, Dang, that's my time. Yeah, that's so, way, oh, that's way back. back. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, okay. Bring it up, bring but, it up though. Um can I bring it up? Did I just lose it? So he basically um, he made a point here of saying that Robbie uh, Tovia Singer says that the Dead Sea Scrolls basically validate uh, the Masoretic text and and show that it's totally legitimate. Um, and here's part of the I, I I was actually when when I was preparing for this I was I was thinking of a couple of different ways to go in how uh, Christian and Jewish apologists uh use and abuse the evidence of the dead sea scrolls here's one direction we could go something that you hear a lot from them is that yes the dead sea scrolls prove the bible they prove the masoretic text they show us exactly that that uh you know the the hebrew text that has gone into making our english translations is totally a legit and it's totally ancient and this is only part of the story there are lots and lots of other copies in the Dead Sea Scrolls of Septuagint texts, of Hebrew texts that look like they were sources for the Greek translation, which is different in numerous places from the Masoretic text. There are lots of copies in the Dead Sea Scrolls of the so-called Samaritan Pentateuch, which is the Bible and the, the version of, of uh, scriptures that was used by the, uh, the Samaritans. There's lots of copies in the Dead Sea Scrolls of things we don't even know how to classify just because we can't figure out how close or far away it is from what we have accepted as the biblical text. And there's no guarantee that these were somehow more or less authoritative than things that we identify as the Masoretic text or the Septuagint or what have you. So the picture is way, way more complicated. Mm hmm now I'm done. Thank you for that. No, I appreciate it. Tovi is a good friend of mine, Rabbi Tovi Singer. Yeah. And he is a Orthodox Jew who has a lot of things that I think are good to say about Christianity. So like when we associate, I ask my audience to try and like open their mind for a second. And the first thing I want to do, they want to do is throw tomatoes, rotten tomatoes at him. You go, why aren't you looking at your own text like that? And it's like, I get what you're saying, but step back for a minute step back for a minute i there are christian scholars for example who might take jabs at um islam okay and they might know some great like very critical stuff about islam and you go you're not being consistent but okay i'll listen i'm gonna listen i'm not gonna jab hey hold on before you tell me anything about islam why don't you examine your own personal faith and you better listen to me no like guys i know what i'm doing as a host here too like i don't spit in my friends faces i disagree with rabbi on his ontological conclusions about the torah the pentateuch the hebrew bible god everything on that but he looks at christianity and he's ready to show there are some problems here now are some of his positions causing him to go too far maybe but he has some really good points he brings out about anti-semitism in the new testament and things like that why Tuesday. why try to jab him because you know what he believes and so it's not my point. It's not, I'm not trying to um, do some street epistemology on Rabbi Singer about his own beliefs. I'm interested in seeing what he has to say about Christianity. Some people cannot stand that about me. 
I mean, I've got Christian apologists who write me going, how could you have this, this rabbi come on and talk? And he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's debated Michael Brown and Michael Brown mopped the floor with him and blah, blah, blah. You know, this Christian apologist versus him. And I'm like, why? Because I see critical problems with Christianity. I see holes yeah. in the New Testament, not only the new, the old, but I don't do shows with rabbi on the old. I do shows with Dr. Kim. Dr. Robert Price, Dr. John J. Collins, Dr. Joel Baden. So in case you're wondering if I'm balanced, I would say I'm pretty reasonable for not being a dumbass who wants to attack his friends who have beliefs on particular things. That's not my interest. I don't care for Jerry Springer or a gladiator match inside the ring. It's my friends. You ever want to see him come back on and talk to other scholars? Or do you want to see Rabbi say bye-bye? I'm never talking to you again. Yeah. Not interested in that kind of thing. No. So got to think like that. Think like that with me, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we have a super chat from Satan, uh, Stephen himself. <clears throat> Dr. Kip, how would you respond to the assertion that the Dead Sea Scroll, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls was a Geniza of, am I saying that right? Yeah. A Geniza of MSS that were disregarded. Yeah. This is a good question. So, uh, the, the assertion that the Dead Sea Scrolls was a genitza of manuscripts that were disregarded. So a genitza is uh, in, um, uh, in Judaism when, uh, when the manuscripts that belong to a synagogue have, have been worn out and are no longer usable, you don't just discard them because, um, because of the, uh, the value that you set on the objects and, and, and the text and such. So um, the, uh, they, they are ceremonially, ceremonially buried um, in what's called a genitza. It's, it's, a, it's a container or an ark or uh, a vault of, uh, of, of uh, worn out manuscripts. And they're deposited there and never reused uh, just be out of the reverence and the, and the respect that, uh, that the Jews have had for, um, for the text. Now, uh, what um, this this guy, this is Stephen? Yes, Stephen. Okay, so what's, what Stephen is getting at here is there's a uh, there's thoughts among scholars that um, I don't think all I don't think there's any scholars who purport that all the Dead Sea Scrolls manuscripts are part of a Genitza, but certainly um, those in Cave One, those possibly in Cave Eleven seem like they might have been part of an ancient Genitza. So there's a couple of things going on here. We can't we can't talk about all the Dead Sea Scrolls as a as a group in this instance. Um, there's I think there's there's certainly the the large cache of manuscripts that came from K4 that I mentioned where there could be somewhere between 520, 560 manuscripts. This was clearly something different. It was more like a library. How do we know this? There are uh, there are um, remnants of uh, of shelving in the walls of the cave, um, and just the sheer number of manuscripts and how contemporary they were for, to one another, and also the fact that a lot of them uh, look to have been intentionally destroyed and and sliced up by, uh, I guess, soldiers as they were raiding, you know, as they were marching through uh, through the the Judean desert on the way to Matsada. Um, mm. So yes, um, it's a good theory. I, I, I'm, I'm particularly keen on this idea that cave one at least uh, might've been something like an ancient Ganitza. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks for the super chat of $6 and 66 cents. Steven, appreciate that. My friend, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dagger squad in the house, Dr. Kip, have, have you talked to um, my friend Garfield on Dagger Squad? I have not. I got to link you up with him. Cool. This, see how see how I work? Garfield, I got your back, I bro. See. I there's see. Some, how you work. There's some Dagger Squad family in here, too, in my chat. We've, we've, we've definitely uh, helped each other out, but he just awesome. wrote a book. Uh, he wrote a book, a scathing book from critical scholarship against the misconceptions and misunderstandings of the black Hebrew Israelite movement. Uh, because oh, he nice. talks to the black community in America, but not only in America, like worldwide uh, on YouTube. 
But uh, he's all about scholarship. And you're right in the alley of educating people. Like your presentations are wonderful. So I really appreciate him because he Thank goes you. and attacks pseudo ideas, like really yeah. out there stuff. And it's not just in the black community. It's everywhere. Like I've got, trust me, I had to cuss someone out the other day. <laughs> Dude, I didn't know who they were. They were friends of mine on yep. Facebook. Then they video called me and I'm like, who is this? And then he started <laughs> telling me how <laughs> stupid I was for accepting the fact that a Holocaust happened and stuff. And I'm like, Oh my oh, God, dude, it got real brutal. ugly real quick. Yeah. And Hitler was a good oh. guy, by the way. And uh, he was an absolute <laughs> stand up. I'm not even joking, dude. This is the stuff. So we um, do the same Nasty. thing in different communities. Nasty. I got to hook you up with him. Seriously. I love you, man. Thanks Garfield. And thank you, Dr. Kip. You know, man, this was last minute. Anytime. I love you, dude. Serious. This was fun. This was, so, we got a lot of likes and a lot of hype. We broke 518 viewers on this show at one point um, live. That was a lot. Uh, haven't yeah, seen any live in a while. Miss Fishing. No, it was you, man, and the, the awesome. whole apologist stuff. So it was you. I'm just here to cater to that, man, and learn from you. And my audience is like me. We're hungry and thirsty to try and learn more about this stuff. In a world where superstition still reign. They still are yes. the, the supreme thought, uh, and we're trying to break down those walls, you know? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. And so, Derek um, Lambert, son of Elion. <laughs> El Elion. Yes, I am. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, Garfield, thank you so much. Dr. Price is coming back. Thank you for the applause, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate it. Seriously, you guys rock. I appreciate everyone here. Go subscribe to Dagger Squad, by the way. And um, Scripture Rippers, he also is in the same family. I appreciate it. Oh, Stephen, you had to hit me. Stephen wow. had to hit me with that 666 again. <laughs> I can't turn down some money now. You know what I'm saying? Uh, survey of Deuteronomy 32 in 20, Modern Bibles, verse 8, 7, uh, 8 through 7, 20. I get, I, I'm, I'm confused here. Sons of God, oh. verse 13, 20. Sons of Israel, and verse 43, uh, 320 long version for 1720 short version. Do you understand what his question is or his statement? Uh, I, or his statement, it looks to me like uh, seven out of 20 of the versions read okay. sons of God for verse eight, and 13 of them read sons of Israel. So, like, that's that's 65 percent, right? But then for verse 43, only three of the 20 preserve the longer version. Versus eighty five percent, which preserve the shorter version. Okay, so I was Thanks mistaken that. earlier. That's, yeah, I was mistaken by saying all of them. I didn't pull up his chart. Um, and that's that's enlightening, right? It is. Why are why are they mostly going with that? I think they're more comfortable going with the Masoretic in this passage. Well, yeah, and and I think I mean there's a it's so from a. I mean, we, we, we shouldn't get into this, but, uh, you know, in the, in the seventies and the eighties in particular, there was a, there was a movement among, um, certainly more conservative leaning, more evangelical type, uh, Christian scholars who were, who were, you know, just getting crushed by, uh, the advances of historical criticism and tradition criticism and rhetorical criticism um, started to retreat into a model of what's called canonical criticism, which is basically the the um, the the idea that it's the it's the you know the Bible that we've inherited, despite all right. the all all the flaws revealed through history. It's what we've inherited that is the uh, um, the inspired Word of God. Um, Reverend Childs was a was a brilliant scholar who who uh, really um, uh, he 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 really pushed this uh, this idea. So I mean, you know, th this is kind of like that, right? Like there's an addition, there's a there's there's a sanctioned uh, text of the Hebrew. Yes, we know there's there's errors and there's there's issues with the history, but we're not concerned about that. We're dealing with this, right? So, yeah, anyway. 
there's a lot of problems with with what with, there's so many problems. No wonder King James Onlyus would love to say we've had it right all along, and uh, don't play games yeah. with it. God preserved His word down to the jot and tittle. Not a single word passed. You know, none of His words yeah, passed exactly. away. They take yeah. that literally and. Those are the scary things about interpretation. Join the Patreon. There's the link in yep. the chat. And also, Dr. Kip, let's do this again. We'll plan it out. Thanks, Stephen, for all the 666s and everybody else in the chat who wants to call me satanic. I love you. I appreciate it. Because you know what's funny about it is I actually don't have a God. I don't believe in superstitious things. But Christians will say, some of them, you everyone knows there's a God. And uh, so, therefore, you willfully ignoring or not believing and accepting these things after everything you just showed, for example, just today. And I mean, there's so many more shows that you can go into showing problems. Um, because I willfully ignore and deny this, I'm automatically on Satan's side. So anytime you take a joke, you call the audience gods, like the video gods, you're satanic. Well, I didn't even say Satan in this, but because I'm not on their team, therefore, it's satanic, no matter what it is or who it is. I mean, That's the mindset. It can't be all bad. I mean, Doug Doug works for Satan, right? And he seems to be doing okay. Doug Doug's a different guy. Like he can handle it. You know what I mean? He can handle huh. it. I'm new to this. Like I just was initiated yeah. recently into the Illuminati, and I just didn't want my whole audience to know. You know what I mean? Like I didn't. Don't tell them though either. Mm. So you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> I think you you got pine points recently, didn't you? For the first time in my life, yeah, yeah, yeah. For the first time in my Way life, way to go, man! I know. I'm, I'm moving on up. I'm go. moving on up. I'm a special guy. Uh, seriously though, let me know what you think of the intro on the way out. Hit that like button if you like yeah. what we're doing. If you don't like what we're doing, hit the dislike button. It's okay. It is what it Those is. Those count too. Those count too. So either way, it just lets me know whether you're on uh, their side or. <laughs> I don't. You might not like it, what and you agree with us. I don't care. It's yeah. whatever. Love you guys, and don't forget. We are Myth Vision. Yes, we are.